Mr. Chairman, uh, items 52 and 53 are related and be my recommendation that they be heard and considered together. And with your permission, I'd like to move forward and read both items into the record. I have a question. Uh, could I get a show of hands? How many people are here to speak on items number 52 and or 53? Okay, we're trying to get an estimate here. If you could raise your hand if you're going to speak because we're going to try to quantify how much time. You don't have to raise your hand, Sheriff. We knew you were speaking, Sheriff. We, we knew you were speaking. There's not that many. Okay. Okay, item 52 is to conduct a public hearing, approve, adopt, and authorize the chairman to sign an ordinance to amend Title IV, Chapter 4.18 of Clark County Code to increase the rate of sales and use tax imposed for the purpose of employing and equipping more police officers in Clark County. It's authorized by Chapter 249 of the 2005 Nevada Legislature as amended by SB 1 of the 2013 Special Session of the Nevada Legislature and providing for other matters properly related thereto. Item 53, the recommendation reads the exact same way. It's a point of distinction. Item 52 proposes to increase the sales tax by 0.15, whereas item 53 proposes to increase the sales tax by 0.075. Thank you, sir. Ms. Miller, we are going to hail both public hearings at the same time. Is that an issue? Is that the call of the chairman? Okay. At this time, I will uh, turn it over to Sheriff Gillespie to make a short presentation on items number 52 and or 53. Then I will open up the public hearing and take comments. Sheriff Gillespie, thank you for joining us. You're welcome, sir. Appreciate you giving me an opportunity to speak uh, prior to public comment. I would also ask uh, after uh, public comment if I would be afforded an opportunity to come back up before you vote. I'd appreciate that as uh, that consideration as well. Yes, sir. Um, today you're faced with a decision that will have a lasting impact on public safety in our community. Today I come before you again representing all law enforcement here in Southern Nevada. Two years ago I was asked to look at potential revenue options to fund an anticipated budget shortfall in the Metropolitan Police Department's budget for fiscal year 14-15. After many meetings with city, county, staff as well as electeds, private sector as well as people within the community, the direction taken was to pursue the second half of what's referred to as the more cop sales tax. In the fall of 2012, approximately a year ago, we received the support of all government agencies in Clark County to proceed to the legislature and ask them as the first step in this process to implement the quarter cent sales tax. What happened at the legislature complicated the issue. If they would have followed and implemented the recommendation from local government, the .25 would have been enabled and the revenue generated from it would have helped us restore positions eliminated during the recession, as well as added officers to all police departments in Clark County. Instead, they reduced the percentage of the tax from the 0.25 to the 0.15, and also added a supermajority vote from you, the county commission, that was not part of the original sales tax that came before you. The 0.15 at Metro lets us keep what we have today and not recover what was lost in the recession. When the 0.15 came to you as a board, it was suggested, and today is one of your options to further reduce that amount of tax to 0.075. The 0.075 does not add officers, and it does not fill our deficit. As I said last week at a press conference hosted by the Department of Justice, actions speak louder than words. Many people were skeptical that my organization could reduce the number of officer-involved shootings when we said we could. Many people were skeptical when we said we could reduce the number of accidents after a deadly 2009. Many people were skeptical in 2004 when we said with these additional cops hired under the more cop sales tax, we would reduce crime. While well, your police department did all of these things and more, 
However, I still hear the skeptics. I say, let us prove them wrong again. Today, the .15 is our best option to fight crime and keep our community safe. The legislature chose to limit us to this .15 against the advice of all law enforcement agencies in Southern Nevada. I ask you to follow our recommendations and enable the .15. The .15 allows us to keep our heads above water and also add positions. By approving the .15, we will save approximately 250 current police officer positions and also have the ability to add 100 additional. In addition to the .15, I will also authorize the current quarter cent fund authorized positions to be raised to 600, adding an additional 51 positions to that account. If you take the 100 from the .15, and the 51 added positions from the initial quarter, that will raise our ratio of police officers to citizens here at the Metropolitan Police Department from 1.74 to 1.84 cops per thousand permanent residents. The increased number of officers, as well as the positions saved, will cost the taxpayers an additional six cents a day 42 cents a week, $1.88 a month, $22.50 a year. And it will also reduce the responsibility of county and city government to fill our current deficit. As you discuss this issue today and then provide direction, let me remind you that our current staffing level at Metro is stretched too thin. And that is why I am proposing the .15 and adding an additional 51 positions on the initial quarter cent. This is a start. Then you potentially have the ability, the county, as well as the city, to increase, increase contributions, allowing our ratio to grow and not have to look at filling that deficit. Today, as I said, our ratio is 1.74 cops per thousand permanent residents. At our peak in staffing in 2009-10, we were at 2.06. If you factor in the tourist volume that visits our valley on a daily basis, our ratio is actually 1.58 cops per thousand permanent residents. As a matter of history, for my organization, you have to go back to 1996 to see a ratio of 1.74 police officers per thousand permanent residents. In my preparation for coming down here this morning, I've done a significant amount of work, not only interacting with a number of you, but many people throughout the community as well as my organization. And I would like to provide you at this time some further documentation that shows that this police officer to citizen ratio does make a difference. The documents that I will give to you for you to look at and for you to ask me more questions of, whether it's later today or down the road, will clearly show you that back in 2003, when crime was trending up, our police officer ratio was down. However, when we had the ability to hire officers over a number of years and that ratio increased, crime rate decreased. Now we are moving into a point in time where our ratio of officers is decreasing and crime is going up. I beg to differ with people's analysis of a 12% increase in crime in 2012 compared to 2011 as slight or just a nudge. 12% is significant. If you look out over the last 10 years, homicides, robberies, fatalities on our roadways, you will see direct correlation between that increased staffing and those number of lives lost and the number of those people victimized by robberies reduced. I believe my organization, as well as others, have been partners in dealing with the downturn in the economy. This is not an easy decision for you. I understand that. Nor is it easy for me 
to stand before you again asking for what I believe is the appropriate funding level for my police organization as well as yours. Chuck, do you have those handouts or they're already done? Thank you. At that time, I'll... Thank you, Sheriff. You're uh, welcome. I will ask you to come back at the end of the public hearing and take, answer, respond to public comments and take commissioner questions, if that's okay with that. you. Thank you, sir. At this time, I will open up the public hearing as it relates to items number 52 and 53. Anyone wishing to address the board, please step forward. Identify yourself for the record. Comments will be limited to three minutes. If you spoke on this item earlier, you cannot speak again in the interest of fairness. I also ask you to please respect all of the speakers have no applauding or catcalls subsequent to any comments that are made. Yes, who wants to begin? Whatever. My name is Melissa Letourneau. Um, that's L-E-T-O-U-R-N-E-A-U. And I think that we need to start this off by just clarifying the fact that this is not the people versus Metro. This is Metro and the people versus a board of seven people who are playing God with our lives and our money. The sheriff himself just said, okay, that it is to, is this is going to reduce the responsibility of this county to fund the metro deficit. Okay, that means that you have a responsibility to fund this. And if I can show you right here, and this is not even the only point I really want to make, so I'll be as quick as I can. Okay. Could I ask him to focus in on what she's pointing to? Right no, the camera. I'm asking them to Sorry. zoom in on you. Okay. okay. You will see that culture and recreation has taken a 4.8 jump from the previous budgetary year. Why do we need 175 more dollars, 175 million more dollars towards culture and recreation when you could be funding our police department if they legitimately need it? Okay. Secondly. If you really wanted to save money with Metro, okay, you can consider this. This is the traffic line item for Metro. It's $26 million. It is the highest line item in their entire budget. Okay, Metro, it, 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 I gave you all pieces of paper. I don't know if you've got them yet. I handed these out to you guys. Okay, you need to consider this, okay? If we were to reevaluate what we expect of these police officers, maybe we could save money. Maybe we could put these police officers so that they are not at odds with us. Why should we be under the thumb of laws that bodies like this and the, and the legislature have created that, that, that penalize victimless crimes? You can't, it, it's like preventative crime. It's, it's the notion that pre-crime, we can just, you know, think that someone might hurt somebody. We're taking personal responsibility completely out of the equation when we do this. So I would just say, but there are two questions here, and I hope you address those before you make this vote. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Don Dunphy. The police department is going through extensive training now. Where was the training in the past? It should have happened a long time ago. Where is the leadership in the, in, the, in the police department? I don't know. People are scared about the American dream. The police department has 130, and yesterday's paper said they had $137 million in reserve. Most people have little or none. Honest words need to be spoken. Every board commissioners, board and commission wants more money for services. How many boards and commissions are, there, are you people on? The players are being squeezed. Money is tight. Stronger leadership is needed by the police and legislature in the city. People voting rights have been validated by the legislature. Only the top five percent of the people, only five percent of the, the upper crust have incomes have risen. County commissioners must listen to the people. They need to pay attention to people's business for the future. Voters need to make changes. The key word is money in hand. More money for police department is unacceptable. They have $137 million in reserve. What have you got, folks? People need to take responsibility for, for tax votes. The governor 
has taken the right of the people to vote away on certain issues. Where is the justice in the county? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Uh, Wendy Putnam Park. And I would like to start by saying that there are four generations of my family that live in Las Vegas, Nevada. And because of that, I am extremely concerned about safety, not only for myself or my children or grandchildren. It's when you go on and you think in the future. I want all of them to be safe, whether they're driving a car, crossing the street, going to the bank, or just being in their own neighborhoods. And I think the one and only way this is going to provide a safe community for the generations that are here now and the generations to come is to make sure that we have a solid police department that will have enough people, enough employees that can come out and respond to any calls that may come forth or to just be there. It is amazing how much difference it can make by having the mere sight of police officers walking along the strip, driving down the street. That is another way of showing that there is safety and within our own community. This particular amount of money that is being asked for is even less than what the voters have already approved. And that's where I find it extremely disturbing that we have council members that apparently really don't want to listen to the citizens of, of Las Vegas because we've already voted for this. We approved of it. We didn't get as much as we requested from the legislature, but we are asking that you give the police department this amount of money now. I think it is vital. There has been a decrease in response times, and I don't know, just happened to turn on the news last night on Channel 8, and they were doing quite a review of what the response times are for police officers now on burglary calls, disturbance calls, um, a number of things where it's not a matter of you now have to wait two minutes to get somebody to respond. You may have to wait two hours. And I find that extremely disturbing. So I'm asking you to please consider this tax. I noticed that the commission didn't have too many problems in raising the gasoline tax. I'm not seeing that as a safety issue for me and my family. And I also see that the commissioners didn't have any problem in raising your own salaries. So I would ask you seriously, this to me is so much more vital and more important to be taken care of at this time. I would also like to put in the fact that I'm now retired, 30 years as a trial attorney, and there were a number of times I probably faced a number of police officers over the year. But you know what? I still admire them, and I want them out on the streets and saving us all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Cecil Becker. I live at 80 Mallory Street in Henderson. Uh, I just would like to say I'm absolutely opposed to this tax. We, uh, as citizens, are just pushed to the limit as it is. We pay over 50 cents a gallon on tax as it is. Uh, and just to use a couple of the sheriff's comments, uh, um, he said the number of officers has decreased. Well, so has the number of officer-involved shootings. Uh, they pay out hundreds of millions of dollars and seem unwilling or unable to uh, reprimand their officers. We have the, the district attorney. I don't know where he, at, where he is. He hides behind his desk and doesn't uh, respond to any of my emails. But, you know, they don't, they don't uh, you know, no, no, there's yeah, I no got to ask you to please refrain from laughter or applause. There is no accountability. And in in, in if you wear a badge, you can do whatever you want. Uh, sure, you might have to pay out a couple of millions of dollars in wrongful death lawsuits, but that doesn't come out of your pocket. We pay that. They refuse. Denver has a police force that's twice as large as ours, and they have half as many shootings as we do. What's our problem here? Why, you know, if they don't, if they're so scared, find a new job. If, uh, you know, if, if, if they fear that, you know, if, if their first response is to shoot somebody because they grab a hat or whatever the, the situation is, that's, that's ridiculous. And I don't feel like we need to fund that. There's no accountability and uh, they just get away with whatever they want. They're, they're bullies with badges. 
And it's ridiculous. I don't think that we, they need any more of our money. They have a surplus, spend it. Uh, they just got a pay raise, actually. They just got a, a mediator just voted them a pay raise. I make $12 an hour. I'm sure they make more than I do. And is my job dangerous? Yeah, sometimes I'm up on roofs. Sometimes they're steep. And I'm helping people out, serving the community. I don't, you know, feel like I need to pay any more money for them. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Mr. Sanson. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Steve Sanson, President of Veterans and Politics International. Before I, uh, I continue, I just wanted to say um, I went to Commissioner Brown's barber and uh, for a little touch-up, and this is what happened to me. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. <laughs> um, you know, when, when we look at the uh, Metropolitan Police Department, especially our leaders, uh, we want to think of uh, three things, and uh, it's transparency, integrity, and uh, fiscal responsibility. And Sheriff Doug Gillespie has uh, made uh, several comments about there's uh, 426 vacancies that needs to be filled within Metro. But uh, what he failed to tell you is that some of these vacancies were eliminated and some of these vacancies were never filled by officers. When I came here the last time and I spoke, um, I also made a comment of who visited Metro headquarters over there, Martin Luther King and, uh, and Alta. And only one county commissioner uh, raised her hand and said that she went over there because I wanted to show you guys the uh, wasteful spending that, 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 uh, that uh, Metro has put into this building at $1.2 million per month in rent so you guys could have an understanding about the lack of fiscal responsibility. Um, the radio, I brought up the radio, $42 million that uh, the sheriff signed off for this radio communication that apparently doesn't work, caused the death of a uh, Gulf War vet, Stanley Gibson, allegedly. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there's countless others, other situations out there that uh, we haven't heard about, but yet his time to sue this radio communication, I believe it was Dare to Sky, has been so gone he can't even go back and sue them for that radio communication problem. $134 million the sheriff has in his reserve program from the last time uh, the tax initiative went into effect. And I remember he was at the legislators and he was working on their, their heartstrings, letting them know that, hey, you know, if you don't put these cops on the street, crime is going to go up and, and, and safety is a factor, the rank and file is a factor. But you know what, if I was sheriff of Metropolitan Police Department and I had $134 million, I'll go hire me more cops without going in front of any board if I could do that. If I was so worried about crime in, in the streets of uh, Clark County. Now, the sheriff also mentioned about these body cameras. And if you take a look at this, th this letter that was written in May of 2013 from the undersheriff Jim Dixon, talking about these body cameras and how they're going to use a, a pilot program at two, uh, two substations to get these body cameras out. Okay, and that was part of passing this uh, this more cops bill. But then you take a look at this letter from the PPA. It shows that Sheriff Doug Gillespie made a deal with the PPA, saying that the officers, the officers hired after July of 2013, don't have to wear these body I cameras. To wrap it up, Mr. Sansa. You know something. The, the, the integrity that goes, on, that goes with, with, the, with the sheriff of Metro has to be taken a really good look at. I don't know if you guys take a look at the collective bargaining contract. Mr. Sanson, I've got to ask you to wrap it up. I, I'm going to wrap it up, uh, Mr. Chairman. But if you take a look at the collective bargaining contract, they give six months of maternity leave for officers. And if you take a look at the, the collective bargaining contract, okay. they, pur they purge Sanson, records. I've got to cut you off now because I've got 50 other people to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thanks. My name is Robert Walker. Address is 400 Brush Street. And uh, before I get started, I just want to uh, say one thing here about Thomas Jefferson. Dom Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence that governments are instituted among men to secure our liberties. So with that idea in mind, I want to go over one page of a 138-page report from Clark County. It's called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. On this one page, we have 
funds governmental activities 11.5 billion, non-governmental activities 12.5 billion for a total of 24.1, and estimated collections of 2.6 billion, which brings us to 26.7 billion dollars. We have investments by Clark County domestic equity fund 80 million domestic bond fund 66.7 money market fund 208,000 Union Central Life Insurance Company 1.5 million New York Life Insurance 14.7 million New York Life Insurance 5.2 million New York Life Insurance 5.3 million New York Life Insurance 5.2 million New York Life Insurance 5 million New York Life Insurance, 4.7 million, for a total of $191,023,000 in investments. Governments are instituted among men to secure our liberties, not to be our investment banker. Before we raise the sales tax for any reason whatsoever, whether it be for new brooms for the street sweeper or more cops on the street. We should find out, divest ourselves of this money, of these investments, put the money in the general fund where it belongs and use it. We really don't need a new sales tax increase. The county has currently $23.8 billion. That's their report. It's on page 54 of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report in case anybody wants, I can show it to you. Thank you very much. We don't need a sales tax increase. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Sisolak. Uh, I'm sorry, Chairman Sisolak and Honorable Commissioners. Last time I was here, um, we, uh, I spoke against this, and I'm asking you again to please vote against another tax. Today's October 1st, 2013, when our Affordable ha uh, Care Act goes into effect. You raised the fuel tax last couple of weeks ago. We're being taxed to death. Metro spent $42 million on a communication system that doesn't work. 100 cops are not going to make us safer. If we exercise our Second Amendment privileges and rights, our God-given right to self-defense, we're all going to be much safer. 100 cops are not going to keep us safe. I'm going to quote another founding father, Ben Franklin, said, those who would give up essential liberty for a little bit of safety deserve neither liberty or safety. 100 new police officers are not going to keep us safe. We're all going to keep each other safe. This is an open carry state. We need to exercise our Second Amendment rights, and we need to audit the Metropolitan Police Department before taxing another Clark County resident another penny. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Good morning, Chairman. This is George Hicks. Good morning, Chairman Sislak and Council and uh, fellow commissioners. This this is totally ridiculous. Our sales tax is too high as it is already. All right, our sales tax needs to be lowered, not raised. The way you prevent crime is to have a strong economy, not tax the people to death so that the economy flounders and then you increase crime that way. A hundred police officers is not going to decrease crime. What's going to decrease crime is to do things that gives us a strong economy. Any tax increase goes against that. So I would urge you, all of you, to vote against this. I would like you to also think about how we can decrease the sales tax, because that has a big, fact, a big effect on our economy. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Ms. Lee. Hello. Um, as you guys know, I was here for the fuel tax. I am not a big fan of taxing citizens. We still have the highest foreclosure rate in the country, unfortunately. Um, one thing that I wanted to make a point that kind of piggybacks on what other people have said already, what I found very interesting when I was looking through uh, Metro's budgets, is uh, the liability insurance. Um, we have already paid out this year alone almost $2 million in retribution for lawsuits. And that comes from the taxpayers. In the last four years, since 2008, $6.5 million 
have been spent in retributions for lawsuits against the Metropolitan Police Department. And um, I find it interesting that in the last couple of years, the budget for liability insurance has been around $1 million, and the requested amount for the 2013 fiscal year is almost $7 million for liability insurance. Now, um, I'm not trying to generalize. I have friends on the force. Uh, I think that our police force does the best that it can. And unfortunately, there are, there are bad apples that kind of paint in the public eye um, a picture that uh, has left people feeling uh, not too warm and fuzzy about our police department, unfortunately. Um, I would feel more comfortable before Metropolitan Police Department asked for any more money from the taxpayers if they were making steps and to address these issues. Why are we having these incidents where the taxpayers are bailing out for, for lawsuits? But unfortunately, as we, we all know, in August, the use of force board completely resigned. That's not a sign of faith that we're moving in the right direction for accountability with our police force. Um, the assistant sheriff was on that and he had resigned. So that was my one concern, that number, an increase of 436% um, for liability insurance really stood out to me and I just wanted to make that point for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Shirley Shelton. Most of what I wanted to say has already been said. I just wanted to ask you, how many taxes have you increased this year? And who's paying those? Because we're losing. The more taxes we pay, the less jobs there are. The less jobs there are, the more the crime is. It's two plus two. You just need to do your homework and you need to have the audit so that we can really analyze this properly. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Proceed. Hi, good morning. My name is Tasha Heath. Um, they. As Andy Matthews from NPRI stated, the employees of Las Vegas Metro continue to be some of the highest compensated employees, public or private, in Las Vegas Valley. Um, I have a few questions that I'd like you guys to ask Gillespie, if you could. Um, where is the fiscal audit we asked for? Should people have to pay more to Metro because they can't budget? Why are they getting an option to wear cameras? Um, where is um, the budget plan? How do we know for a fact that he will be using this for more police? Um, how much will Metro be getting from the internet sales tax? We need better training and better budgeting before we give any more of our money to Metro. Uh, they need to learn to work within their budget, stop shooting first and asking questions later, stop making deals with friends for faulty equipment. All these things need to be addressed before we give them more money. Shiny badges don't grant extra rights. You guys, we need to be listening to the people about the taxes. You guys have raised taxes how many times in just the past couple of months? I suggest you don't do it again right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Kelly W. Patterson. And uh, personally, I haven't seen any evidence that there's a shortage of cops. Um, they had enough cops to conduct a two-month investigation of some people riding on, side, on sidewalks with chalk. Um, they have enough cops that they can shut down Fremont Street every first Friday and set up what looks like an East German checkpoint to make sure that somebody doesn't carry a beer from one bar to the next. They have enough cops to have undercover cops going up and down uh, the strip to make sure that somebody isn't selling water because they're competing with casinos, because the casinos sell the water for more money. This isn't a matter of them not having enough money. It's a matter of priorities. They found enough money to take some second-rate guitar player that hardly anybody ever heard of out for a helicopter ride because he wanted to, um, he wanted to propose to his girlfriend. They found the money to build that giant headquarters in the middle of the worst recession in history. They found the money to uh, – well, anyway, the, uh, the elephant is in the room. It's always in the room because there's no, no evidence of it whatsoever. In fact, there is no, there's evidence that has never happened is accountability. There's no accountability whatsoever with Metro or with any Las Vegas Police Department. They – they're paying cops to sit home on vacation after they murder somebody. 
Jesus Arevalo has been home for almost two years now after he murdered Stanley Gibson. There's nothing, absolutely nothing whatsoever that should, that should justify shooting somebody. And yet the, in the history, in the 40 year history of Metro, not one single cop has ever been brought up on charges for shooting somebody. Even if that person's been unarmed and completely innocent. The entire 40 year history of Metro, not one single person. The fact that it was, it was called unprecedented when the use of force board recommended that somebody be fired for shooting somebody because they thought his hat was a gun is disgraceful. The fact that Sheriff Gillespie over here refused that recommendation is beyond disrespectful. It's an insult to this community. There's, there's, they're paying out millions of dollars to people who have been either murdered or brutalized by the police. And I'm, I've seen people within my own community where the police are stopping them because they don't have a, a bell on their bicycle or their headlight on their bicycle isn't bright enough because they're looking for any excuse they can to stop people in certain neighborhoods. We've got all these police running around just harassing people, and yet we're told we need more police. There's certain neighborhoods here where they take these saturation teams and they go through, and it's actually part of the stated purpose of these saturation teams that they are going to stop anybody they can for any reason. I've got to ask you to wrap it up, Mr. Peterson. Okay. Well, they need to, instead of coming here and asking us for more money to, to uh, offset their budget that they're wasting, they need to learn how to actually have a budget Thank and you. how to actually prioritize what they're doing instead of being out there harassing everybody and then saying, hey, give us more Thank of your money so we can harass you, you more. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Board of County Commissioners. My name is Mujahid Ramadan. I live at 5601 Indian Ridge Drive in North Las Vegas. Actually, I live in uh, Commissioner Collins District. And uh, contrary to this gentleman's observation, living in North Las Vegas, I don't see police officers very often. I live near Ann Road in Camino El Norte. It's really because of the fact that our police department there is struggling with the fact that very few officers are, are available. So we're not seeing a lot of police officers there. Um, Saturday night, there was a woman. She was killed in the Bolden Area Command, close by here, uh, just north. And um, her name was uh, Dixie Cheney. I grew up in the same neighborhood with her. She was shot to death by... Uh, a young boy, and a young boy was driving a car. She probably would have liked to have seen a police officer. She was 71 years old. That's so troubling because, you know, at 71, you think you can live your life in comfort. And it's not the police fault there. That's the fact that, you know, we just have troubled young boys who grow up unnurtured and uncared for and untouched, and they don't have no sense of what a life is. So he shot her because he just wanted to make a little quick money. And uh, driving away, just so happened there were two officers in the neighborhood on feet looking for another crime, and they saw a car driving down the street, and uh, the lights were turned off, and then they called in, and they apprehended them pretty quickly. And that's been happening in the Bolden Area Command. Even when there are fewer homicides, they are capturing people pretty quick. The, the community members feel a bit safer with the Area Command, the, the police officers that are there. Uh, they call in and they give information, they see something, they say something. And this is historically been a community that's been most trouble with this relationship with the police department. But it's working quite well now. But back to Miss Dixie. Um, I think if Miss Dixie was here this morning, she would say, vote for more cops. But she doesn't have a voice. Um, there are a lot of people like Miss Dixie's who are baby boomers who live in that immediate neighborhood, who some don't want to leave and others who can't afford to leave. They like to see more cops. The young children who get the benefit sometimes of going camping in the summer or going to Mount Charleston in the wintertime when they're out of school at Matt Kelly and other school, they probably like to see more cops. Uh, people who live in housing complexes who now see their neighborhood safer and their quality of life changing, they probably like to see more cops. But really, it's in your hands. So when you vote today, Think about Miss Dixie, who was shot five times, and there was nobody there to help her. And the fact that that life is gone, and her whole family has been traumatized, and the two young men who were involved in the event, their lives are gone also, and their families are going to be traumatized. Think about those type of people who can't speak for themselves, and it's in your hands. They say one time there was a man in West Africa. He was known as the smartest man in West Africa. 
And some young boys decided one day to decide to prove that he wasn't a smart man. So they took up this idea. They said, we're going to put a bird in our hands and our boy, put this bird in front of this man, and we're going to ask him, is it a dead bird or a live bird? If he says it's a live bird, we'll crush it and prove him wrong. If he says it's a dead bird, we'll let it grow and prove him wrong. They went and knocked on his door. They said, oh, man, is it a dead bird in our hands or a live bird? He said, it's in your hands. And that's where this vote is at, and that's where the lives of people like Miss Dixie and others are at. And hearing the concerns of other individuals, please keep those people's lives who can't speak for themselves. Thank you. Got to ask you to wrap up. Thank you. Mr. Collins. Mr. Commissioner, Commissioners, uh, my name is Chris Collins. I am the Executive Director of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's uh, Union, Las Vegas Police Protective Association. It represents the line officers and the corrections officers. I also have the great honor of being the President of the Southern Nevada Conference of Police and Sheriffs, which represents the Henderson supervisors, as well as the North Las Vegas police officers. In short, we're here in support of the 1.5, obviously. But there's been a lot of testimony here today about things that, quite honestly, have nothing to do with the More Cops initiative. Uh, they've talked about the shootings. They've talked about a helicopter ride. Those things are for the sheriff to address, and he is addressing them, I can assure you. Uh, I see it happen every day. They've talked about contract negotiations and how the police officers got a raise. Police officers have been getting raises since 1973 when Metro was formed, and they will continue to be contract negotiation raises into the future, whether this passes today or not. Those things do not belong in this conversation. I support the, the, the talk. I'm happy to have discussions with anyone who wants to talk about them. But we're here today to talk about more cops. The reserve that they speak of, $137 million, that is because Sheriff Gillespie and his staff have managed that money well. That money has to last into the future to pay the salaries of the 600 police officers that the sheriff talked about would be on the payroll. If that money is dwindled away and spent down to nothing as, a, as an extreme, that, those 600 police officers' salary will fall back on you, the county, and the city to fund because that money will not be there. That money cannot be spent. Trust me, I would like to see them dip into it and spend it and, and help out, but it needs to be there into the future. This first quarter cent of more tax cops money goes away in 2025. That, set, that sunsets. If the legislators do not reenact it, that money won't be there to pay for them. Let's talk about what more cops really comes down to for all of you, okay? It comes down to a vote to ensure the public safety of everyone in this room, everyone who lives in Clark County, and the 43 million tourists who come to our, our county each and every year. The sheriff has come here and told you that the numbers are dwindling. We have proof in 2005 when the economy was booming, if not for then under Sheriff Gillespie and Sheriff Bill Young and their team, the more cops bill would not have happened. But it's been said here today that economy will fix crime. Crime was on the rise in 2005. No one can say that the industry, that the economy wasn't booming here. Casinos were being built, but crime was on the rise. They got the half cent approved by the voters, okay? All we're asking that you do today is approve what the voters already have given us. In closing, I would just like to say, all of you that I have been up and down the hall with have said to me, you have received emails. You have approximately 120,000 people in each of your districts. If you have received 1,000 emails, that's less than 1% of your constituents who have contacted you. It is always the vocal minority We've got who to comes out. wrap it up, Mr. Collins. So please vote yes and know that your constituents and the men and women of public safety will remember today's vote. Thank you, sir. Good morning, buenos dias. My name is Jose Solorio. I reside in Commissioner Larry Brown's district. I've been a resident here in Las Vegas since 1970 as an 11 year old. I come here today in support of the uh, 15 cents per $100 tax that will improve the safety of our community. And to me, a nickel a day is not much of a price to pay for there to be increased safety in our community. And I'll give you a personal example, um, one that I haven't shared. But uh, eight years ago, um, I got a call from my daughter. Uh, she was hostage, kidnapped. 
I made a call to Metro. At that time, I wasn't politically involved. Um, within an hour, uh, we had a team. They had a team. Um, I was vested. I went and picked up my daughter. She's safe. Today, she's going to college. Had that not happened, she could have well been killed. So our police officers are doing their job day in and day out. Many incidents that you don't know about. And for there to be a decrease in our officers per thousand means that the response time could mean a life or a death. And we need to take that into account. And today, you're probably going to decide between 15 cents or 7.5 cents. And you're going to try to negotiate to make some people happy. But it's not about making people happy. It's about being public safety out there. It's about us having the, the right amount of police officers, officers there to protect our community, to protect our sons and daughters and mothers and daughters and grandmothers. Now, we may not agree, or you may not agree how they spend the money. That's one thing. You may not agree how they have a pot of money set aside for more cops. That's a different thing. But today, the voters have already approved a quarter per hundred dollars, and they're only asking for 15 cents. A nickel a day is worth the safety of our citizens, and we should invest that. And there should be no negotiation between 15 cents and seven and a half cents. And come election time, this will be an issue in each and every one of yours, re-election or if you seek higher office, whether or not you voted for public safety when you were a commissioner. Which way did you vote when public safety was on the line? Did you vote for it or against it? Or did you side with the minority out there that is crying no taxes for any reason? You're here to serve us. I'm asking you to serve us. Approve the right amount. Approve the 15 cents today. Public safety is number one in anybody's book. Please keep that number one in your vote today. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Larry. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, chairman and commissioners, my name is Lisa Mayo. First thing I wanted to say um, is I hope that everybody watching and all 120,000 of your constituents in your district realize that Chris Collins, who is up here basically lobbying against, I think, citizens in many ways, is paid for by you, the taxpayer. You pay his salary and those of his eight officers. So I think people should realize that when people come up and, and say that. I'm actually here today um, on behalf of many of the Oh, officer-involved shooting families, Eric Scott, Raphael Levis, Tanner Chamberlain, and South Lee Ketmany, um, all victims of officer-involved shootings. The most recent was July 23, 2013, when Mr. Ketmany, a 35-year-old father of two young children was and a Vegas tourist, was shot and killed by Metro officers. If video was available in all of these officer-involved shootings, going back to Eric Scott and all the others, the truth would be much easier for families to find as they looked for answers. Um, I testified to the legislature on May 22nd, 2013, in support of the more tax cops. I was there to support this tax. So long as mandatory body cameras were part of the more cops tax increase and would be considered required equipment. Why body cameras? Because studies coupled with actual police department results show that body cameras improve the public trust and result in fewer complaints against police departments. They are a win-win for both the public and the police. In a May Senate committee hearing, Senator Reuben Kewen asked for a letter from Metro ensuring body cameras for all officers. I believe that we've put this up before, but I'll put it up again. Uh, this letter stated, Here's the letter, and I was so encouraged that the sheriff and Metro were in favor of body cameras. They had been working with the NAACP, the ACLU, and other work groups on body cameras. The letter was very encouraging, and the letter promises in the last sentence to maintain our communication with the public. I consider myself a part of that public because I was testifying at the legislature. Then I found out that a letter dated July 15, 2013 from the PPA was sent to all Metro officers bragging the PPA convinced Metro to make the wearing of body cameras voluntary for all officers except those hired after July 30, 2013, which amounts to about 30 officers of the 600 officers they have. There was not a press release, 
There was no public communication as promised. I and the NAACP and others had to find out about the letter on our own with no direct communication from Metro. This is a breach of public and political trust. If all officers are not wearing body cameras and only a few rookie cops are forced to wear them, this will erode the already poor culture that exists in our police department. Good police work is based on strong teamwork, good communication, and a common bond to protect one another. I'm almost done. One officer with a body camera and others who, who do not wear a body camera will result in morale issues and most certainly legal issues down the road. Because of this breach of trust and lack of transparency related to body cameras, I urge you to not vote for the more tax today. People will not remember public safety in your elections. They will remember transparency, and open seat, up, and honesty. Ma Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marlo Turner. I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Nevada, and I was not planning on speaking today, so please forgive my casual appearance. Uh, what prompted me to come up here today was uh, seeing a number of the speakers who did come up here. Uh, I happen to know many of them. Many of them spoke about integrity and transparency, and yet many of them came up here with their own agendas, which they failed to disclose to you. Um, as far as the no new taxes, you know, we have, um, actually, let me just go back a second. I have spent my life fighting for equality and for civil rights. I know many of you in this community. I know many of you sitting in the audience. When we're fighting for everybody, we have to remember that everybody is a sum of its parts. Metro is not everybody. Metro is a sum of its parts. There are many people in here who don't care for the sheriff. There are many people in here who don't care for me or for you or for somebody else. We have to take it apart and look at what is the good and what is the bad. At the end of the day, the good is about public safety. The good is about when I make that phone call, will there be somebody there who answers my call? This isn't about do you like the sheriff? It isn't about do you like taxes? It's not about do you like police officers? Do you like government intrusion? It's about public safety. At the end of the day, the tax, the 15 cent, is going to go to the rank and file. It doesn't go to the sheriff. It doesn't go to me or to you. It goes to ensure public safety. It's the rank and the file, and it's the citizenry. As a lifelong resident of Las Vegas, my children are born and raised here. Public safety is important to me. I ask for your vote in favor of the tax. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am a resident of um, Chairman Sisolak's district, and I'm a cop mom. That's my agenda. And I'm also um, a volunteer at Metro, and so I support police officers because I know the sacrifices made by families, by spouses, by children. I know that they know the dangers that are faced. And I've also observed in my decades a change in criminal activity. It's become much more violent, much more cruel. And I hear it's hands-on every time, almost every time. It's not a respectful yes, sir, and obey the law, as my mother brought my brothers up to do. And so the violence that we're facing would be very difficult to face without police officers there to help us. If we had to face it in our own neighborhoods, and I'm in a working class neighborhood that's changing, but we've been blessed. We, my husband and I started a neighborhood watch years ago and we got to know our neighbors a little bit. That does help. But it's not the same thing as having someone coming through your door and being able to respond. I really don't want to be a concealed weapon carrier. I don't want to have to feel that it's so unsafe. I'd better learn to shoot a shotgun <laughs> through my front door. I would like to continue to have the presence of law enforcement. And the one, the one piece of data that holds up is the correlation between presence and public safety. And that's why now that we're changing Las Vegas and the way it's, we do business, we want a New Year's Eve Mardi Gras atmosphere on the Strip and downtown all the time. We were bringing it outdoors. That means we're going to have to pull 
our officers out of our neighborhoods and send them to the Strip, where there's alcohol flowing on the streets, where everything's happening out there in the open. Even the pimps and the drug dealers feel safer if there's presence there. They're safer, too, as well as the rest of our tourists, and our tourists are bringing in the money. So I think that we really need to seriously consider that. And the other point I want to make as part of the family of law enforcement is that I know of no other body so under scrutiny, not any other body where people take pictures of everything police officers do. Somebody's got a camera. They are always under scrutiny. And I want, I want them to know of my support. And I hope you'll support them as well. Thank you. Thank you. We can line up two people at the microphones here. It'll move a little quicker. Uh, Dorothy shortly. Barnes, sorry. Dorothy Barnes, Las Vegas resident. I have a mailing address of P.O. Box 466. I, here I do support law enforcement, but what I'm against, I got a ticket from an officer. It's, it's badge number 8727 here. I told him I was coming. His name, last name Jackson. Badge okay. number 8727. Ba ja officer Jackson. I told him I was coming to this meeting. What happened, he wrote me the ticket, right? I've been trying to get an appointment with Sheriff Gillespie. The last two meetings he was at the county commissioner meeting, he told me to call the secretary and make an appointment. Every time I call, the secretary will not give me an appointment. So what I felt the need to do was go back out by the freeway with my sign that said, please help. Anybody that will tell the truth or let me on Nellis, please help. He comes along on his motorbike. Other officers had passed me by because they know of this situation. Of course, they don't want to be embarrassed. But he comes by, and he's bold, and I'm telling him, well, I've been trying to get an appointment with Sheriff Galipsky to sell this thing and get some information on how I can get some results, because I'm robbed without a gun day and night in this city. I'm lied on. I'm sickly. I get lied on in my doctor's office. My doctor's frustrated. I'm the only patient he got that he can't get the truth on. And I don't want doctors operating on me and messing my health up about lies that people that's stealing money from me, what they call stipend, and it's a dignified way to rob this disabled and sickly people. And I've asked them to remove my name off their program. I had a confrontation on the way here at the bus station, and I called the police. I said, well, I'm on my way to the county commissioner's meeting to complain now. Allied bargaining is no good to protect the customers. I pay the same price every other customer pay. But then, I want good officers. We don't want to hire nobody else that's not efficient. We don't, you can have a lot of people that don't know what they're doing. You have a few that know what they're doing and get the job done and believe in taking care of business. Getting law and order. I've had people sell drugs over me, theme off of me, and I, I found out that an officer was even engaged in sex with a lady, a friend of mine that's doing drugs, and I, I don't need no more officers like that. I don't want no more on the force child molesting, uh, pedophile, doing these things. We need good, qualified officers that will have a good reputation, uphold a reputation for the whole police department and the whole citizen, not just work for certain people. We need good officers. I'm voting for good officers, but I, I, I want Officer Jackson to know that I did come. Badge number 8727, and I'm called out to city council meeting. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Gina Grison. Uh, I wish I would have done that when I got the ticket um, in error by the officer way out there in the northwest, and the charges had to be dropped, but after I had to take three days off of work to go do it. Um, but they did issue a nice newsletter throughout Metro about my situation um, because I guess a lot of places issued tickets in error on stop signs. But anyway, um, I'm here today because I'm confused. I know that this was an issue, uh, you know, last month or so, and there was a line of people, and I hope all of their comments will be considered because they probably couldn't come back today to talk about the more cops issue. Um, you know, I, th and I think that was one of the reasons it was postponed. There was a line out the door. They were actually stopping people from coming in that day because it was a fire hazard. Um, I, I may be mistaken, but can someone tell me if there were town halls held and things like that? I, I was told that there was going to be all these town halls and there was going to be all this discussion because there were so many unanswered questions about this Amor Cops issue. I didn't see any. I was prepared to attend. I have a lot of questions. I didn't see any town halls held. So I guess what I'm going to say today is not to vote for or against. What I'm going to say is, I don't think we're prepared. I don't think you're prepared to vote on this. I don't think the people have had all their questions answered, which the sheriff promised. And since that last meeting, the sheriff has decided not to run for reelection. And to give, you know, money, uh, 
you know, basically to a sheriff that is no longer accountable to the people because he's choosing not to run again. Um, and I'm not saying I don't trust him. I'm just saying there's so many issues within Metro. And I heard a speaker before me say, this is about the more cops. This isn't about shootings or helicopter rides. No, this is exactly what this is about. Because when we were here, when all the officer-involved shootings were occurring, the only way that we can actually get the attention of Metro is through purse strings. And everyone in this room knows that. We can only get that attention. When we passed all those coroner's inquest reforms, it was because everyone was running for election, everyone was on their best behavior, and as soon as the elections were over and this board got back together again last January, they, they reversed all of the hard work that we had done. So this is, you know, when it comes to money, that's the only time you can get people's attention to do the right thing. I, I heard the sheriff earlier talk about, we, we brought the shootings down, we did this. We did. Why were the shootings ever up? Why were they ever up? Why were we shooting citizens that shouldn't, unarmed citizens? Why was that happening in the first place? We should have, I mean, that was like when my daughter said, but mom, I brought my grades up. Well, you know what? They never should have dropped in the first place. So I'm just here to say, I don't think the questions have been answered yet. I think obviously there's been a long line of people here that have a lot of questions. There's still a lot of concerns. And now with all due respect to the sheriff, because I think he's a nice man, we have a lame duck sheriff. Okay, and I, and I don't think that we should be giving the money now. I think we should wait. We have a, obviously we're gonna have a new sheriff soon, or next year, you know, let's wait. Please, thank you. Thank you, yes sir. <clears throat> uh, hi, Gary Cristone, Clark County. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is I'd like to talk about just law enforcement nationwide, not just Las Vegas. And from my eyes, I see that uh, the biggest crimes in our country Police officers, police officers don't prosecute. For example, when we had the 2008 uh, false flag uh, economic crisis, uh, according to AP and Bloomberg, the bankers stole over $30 trillion from the American people. It was a transfer of wealth from the working class, the middle class, to the very richest people in society. They weren't prosecuted. The Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, stole, uh, what is it, $100 million from the American people. And when he was asked, who gave you authorization? Uh, oh, nobody did, he said. He said, I gave myself a waiver. Uh, how about all the corporate and Wall Street criminals that have shipped all the jobs that people can support a family on to slave labor countries, such as China? Why aren't they prosecuted? Uh, how, about, how about another one is... Uh, Monsanto, one of the most evil companies in the world, are poisoning our food with GMO food, GMO corn, GMO soy. If you go to any, go to any grocery store, all the packaged food, it'll have corn syrup this, high fruit, uh, corn starch this, soy this, soy that. Uh, what else? How about the fluoride, the poisons that are putting in our water, including here in Clark County? How come no one's being prosecuted for putting poisons in our water? And, uh, one of my favorite shows last I watched, uh, I mean, listened to on Saturday was Coast to Coast AM. It had, uh, the guest was William Scott, the father of the murdered uh, uh, Eric Scott. He was talking, you can play, you go to YouTube and you can bring it up. Just type September 28, 2013, it'll come right up. You can listen to it. He talked about uh, the, uh, the good officers in the Metro that he was, uh, that, that he's communicating with. And, and uh, they said that in their opinion, about 25 to 30 percent of the officers in Metro are rogue cops. A lot of them are kids between, the, he said, this is what the, he said, between 25 and 40 years old who grew up on video games where they're desensitized to killing people. He stated that what they said was, and the good cops, if they, they, they run into someone with trouble, they would, uh, you know, they would gradually, progressively, go from less force to more force. They would bring out the baton. Maybe they would bring out the taser and then shoot someone. But these 30 percent are, are just ready to kill people. So we the people are sick of that. And then when, the last time I was here, I mentioned that uh, Sheriff Gillespie uh, apparently didn't have an oath of office from whenever he took office in 2000, what was it, 2006 or 7, until April 30th of, uh, of this year. So from a legal standpoint, he was not our sheriff. Sheriff Gillespie was operating under the color of law. I mean, if, that, if that's not true, please correct me, Sheriff Gillespie. Uh, so uh, what else have I got to say? 
I mean, you commissioners all have children and grandchildren. And, you know, maybe 15, how about 15, 20, whenever. If your grandson or granddaughter comes up to you and say, you know, what did you do to stop this police state? I've got to ask you to Hopefully you'll say, I, I, I decided to de-escalate uh, this police state and tyranny. I've got to thank ask you. you. Did you want to identify yourself for the record? I don't know if they got oh, that. Oh, Gary, you. Gary Cushon. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Rick Brown, uh, O'Bannon Drive, Las Vegas. We were here about a month ago on the same topic, and I got up and spoke, and I said that we needed to audit Metro before changing any tax structure. They have money to use. They're not going to fall apart. The sky's not falling, Sheriff. Tomorrow, if you don't have the tax increase, we're not all going to, to perish. The, the, the union man wants everybody to think, you know, and hide the, the money that is there to, to be used. We, we, we have so much waste going on. And I cited three instances before you last month. And somebody said, well, you only found three things. I said, no, I only had two minutes. You know, uh, the sheriff gets up and speaks, and he can speak as long as he desires, I guess. But when you hear from us, we get two minutes. And there's probably a lot more to be said. We need a audit in Metro. We must do something to stop uh, the, the wasteful spending that's going on. And you come to us and want more money. You raised the gas tax last month. You, you, you raised the, the price of water last month. And, you know, w come on, where's it going to end, folks? You know, uh, I don't, I'm not able to go to somebody and say, well, I'm a little bit short this year. I, I need you guys to help me out. No, I have to reevaluate my spending. I have to reevaluate what I do with my money. If I can afford to go to get a hamburger or whatever. But they also are responsible for their money. And they need to live within their means, just like I do, just like you have to. It's time that we audit Metro. It's time that we know what's going on. It's time that there be some, some uh, a, a glass held over that, and so we can see what's going on. Thank you very much. And I'm against this tax. Thank you, sir. I've got to ask you to refrain from applause, please, and I respect all the speakers. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Warren Hardy, I'm here today representing the city of Mesquite. And uh, Chief Tanner and I, here today, are, I are here today because uh, we're a little bit concerned that there's been so much focus on Metro, and that's appropriate. Uh, there ought to be a lot of focus on Metro. Metro is the largest police department impacted by this. But there are small police departments that are impacted greatly by this who don't have a surplus, who don't have a lot of the other things that we have a, the potential that have been discussed as potential options. Uh, I have a long history on this issue. In fact, uh, in another life as uh, chairman of the Senate Government Affairs Committee, I introduced the original legislation to bring this question before the people. And it was important to me at that time that the question did come before the people. But with all due respect to Metro, the reason I introduced that was not because I was concerned about Metro. Certainly we're, we're concerned about all law enforcement. But I was concerned about the small uh, rural and small town uh, police departments that I represented, including Mesquite, Boulder City, Henderson. I had parts of North Las Vegas. That's the reason I, I agreed to sponsor the legislation to bring the original question forward and to ask the people about it. And it's interesting that we've, we've been involved in a debate here, quite uh, quite lengthy debate this morning, and every single person has spoken to the impact on Metro. Again, very very important. But I want to I want to make sure the council or the commission. Uh, keeps in mind that there are other police departments that are dramatically impacted by this. Mesquite is a border city. It, it, we are the first line of defense in law enforcement for this county. Uh, yet we have a police officer to uh, resident uh, ratio that is the lowest in the state. Um, and so I just, w with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to just turn it over to, if I could, Chief Tanner, to talk about our particular needs. But we really want to make sure that the focus is also on the small departments as well. Thank you. And I want to make sure the clerk starts the clock over again so he gets his full three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Good Thanks. morning, Commissioners. Uh, Chief Troy Tanner, Mesquite PD. Um, Mesquite Police Department had a, I've said this before, had a 7% increase in Part 1 crimes 
since 2011 to 2012, over a year, we've had a 7% increase also. And on top of that, of course, our calls of service have raised. We've had uh, probably about a 15% increase in calls, even though revenues declined and the population has decreased to some degree. Um, I also want to make you aware that uh, as far as our ratio, 1.58 officers per 1,000, national average is 2.0. Um, that's including our administration. It's myself and two captains. So we do have a small department, and uh, but this is vital to our organization, the money you know, that we receive, and we appreciate the funding we've had up to this point. Um, the, 15, the point 15 will raise our ratio to 1.71. It would give us two more officers, and uh, that's a big difference to us. I know we're small, like I said, but that's a huge difference. And uh, revenue declines have hit us hard, and uh, we only have about $26,000 left in reserves. And like some agencies, we're, we were so low in our reserves, we actually took one of our more cops officers and our city council was nice enough to allow us to move it into the general budget this last year in 2013. So we've had such a decline in revenue, we can't even support the officers we currently have in more cops. And I appreciate the relationship and knowing we can always call Metro for assistance. I have done that several times this year. Um, we have Bunkerville right next to us. We communicate really well. The sheriff and his staff have been excellent as far as needing help on a couple of homicides we had this last year to send CSI teams up that we're not large enough to have. Other agencies contact me, such as North Las Vegas and Henderson, and offered their people also. So our relations have been great in Clark County. We work well together. Um, like I said, we value that relationship. Mesquite Anchors Emergency Services in the northeast corner. And I-15 has a lot of traffic, of course. You know, the corridors, we have the corridor right on the edge of our town. Department of Assist other agencies, we have reduced presence in that area. And we want to continue to provide a safe gateway to Southern Nevada. All law enforcement agencies in Clark County utilizing partnerships to help cover the deficit created in funding shortfalls. Um, by these partnerships, they cannot put more officers on the street. We need your vote. Like I said, vital to Mesquite. It's important to me. I went up to legislation and testified every chance I got because it is important to our city. So I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman, County Commissioners, my name is Joe Cronister. I'm the Chief of Police in the City of North Las Vegas. First, let me tell you, thank you for your time and this opportunity to be here. As far as the City of North Las Vegas goes, it's, it's well reported. The, the budget shortfalls that we've experienced in the City of North Las Vegas, I can assure you, just from the Police Department alone, we've experienced a decrease of roughly between 35 and, 50, and $40 million in our budget over the last four years that has had a significant impact on our operation. We're, we are authorized 394 police officers. We currently have 268, which equals 1.165 officers per thousand residents in the city of North Las Vegas. As Mr. Ramadan stated earlier, he lives in North Las Vegas and he doesn't see a lot of police officers driving through his neighborhood. Unfortunately, that's the reality that we live in today. Um, we've had to close our jail. Uh, as a result of, of budget reductions. The City of Las Vegas and North Las Vegas have partnered and uh, have a shared services agreement where we've been able to take on and, and ensure that we were still able to, to continue to at least have a portion of our um, jail services that are still a North Las Vegas component. I, I think it goes without saying that for a period of, of, of of time in the early 2000, 2004, 5, 6, the city of North Las Vegas is one of the fastest growing communities in the nation. Also during that period, shortly after that, we had two and sometimes three of the top foreclosed zip codes in the nation. Our dependency upon property tax has been very much impacted. The more cops has truly been a lifeline to the residents of North Las Vegas, as well as the men and women of the North Las Vegas Police Department. We're absolutely committed to doing everything that we can to partner with all the local law enforcement agencies, as well as our federal partners here within this valley, but as well, we're committed to the residents to do our very best with what it is that we have. I urge you to consider what this more cops increase would mean to the residents of North Las Vegas, as well as the men and women of the North Las Vegas Police Department. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. 
My name is Marlene Droz, and I, work, I live in Clark County. And I've heard a lot of uh, impassioned pleas today, and uh, I'm against the tax because I feel everyone on this commission, before they rule on anything, is do a line-by-line -line audit of each. I believe that Metro does have the money. I just believe it's wasteful spending. Now, back in 2008, when the recession was in full swing, there were 2,498 officers on the payroll. Five years later, today in 2013, there are 2,480. That's a difference of 18 officers. I don't believe this tax is going to be spent on more officers. I believe they should tap into the reserve fund, uh, and it should be used. That's what it's there for. The taxpayers can no longer afford this burden. We have no more money. Before any tax, we, like the gentleman before, he said, you know, the gas tax, the water tax, NV Energy, we are being taxed to death. Before any taxes, and that includes property taxes, I think the commission, well, and the state legislature also should be looking at, which might please go uh, on deaf ears, the gaming tax. It's only 6.75%. Why do they get a break? There are so many casinos in this town. It's not going to hurt the casino industry to raise that tax 10% and to be 10%. That would give a lot more revenue to the valley, to the state, where it can go to other uh, police uh, in smaller counties. I mean, they have to look at this. Uh, the money is there. There has to be an audit. Everything is being wasted, and the taxpayers, uh, they need relief. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Peter DeJoseph, uh, here today in favor of the cop tax. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to mention um, regarding the sheriff and his issues. I'm sure the sheriff, like myself, has had days when I wake up and turn on the news and see the cost of Concordia racked up on the rocks of Italy. And... I'm, at that point, I have to get down on my knees and forgive myself for all the stupid things I've ever done in my life. And I'm sure the sheriff has had days like that. So another thing the sheriff understands is, as a master car custom carpenter who's built many multi-million dollar homes in my lifetime, it takes a lot of money to get things done. And there's a lot of responsibility to get that thing, those things done. And I think the sheriff understands that when he says he needs this cop tax. As a long-haul truck driver on and off for the last 24 years, I've been everywhere in the U.S. and Canada at least three or four times. I've walked the streets of poor, po impoverished neighborhoods all from coast to coast of this country. There's a dynamic going on in this country where the word is getting out that it's better to be poor in Las Vegas than it is to be poor anywhere else in this country. There's more here to give than anywhere else. People are coming to Las Vegas from all over the country to escape the horrid, impoverished conditions that we have never seen here in Vegas. The poverty that existed down there in, 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 the, in the parishes in New Orleans would make, bring tears to your eyes that people live like that. The poverty in East Kansas City, the poverty in all of Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, horrible conditions. Anyway, thousands of people are are flocking to Vegas, to Clark County. It's apparent in the number of students we have in the schools. We have to look beyond the, end, behind, beyond the tip of our nose to understand what's going, what we need to do. Um, the, uh, uh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought here, but, but uh, the one thing, our main the one thing that we've really got to understand is we've got to prevent Clark County from being L.A. County someday. L.A. County is a violent, vicious, sadistic, uh, corrupt, concrete jungle of a city. And if we're not careful, we're going to be the same way as L.A. If you don't believe me, please get in your car. Go to L.A. County. Go to the courtrooms there. Start with a traffic court. See what's going on in there. The judges are just taking the, the file and tossing them over their shoulder. They're so frustrated 
with the level of crime and corruption and, and, and uh, the, uh, the problems that are going on in that county. We can't get there. And Doug Gillespie knows it. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Mr. Chief. Hey, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I'm here again before you today to ask for your support in, the, in this measure. Um, the city of Henderson has been a very beneficial and benefited from the More Cops initiative. Um, you know, the city of Henderson had a 267 officers uh, for the general fund, which is less than one officer per 100,000 people. After the tax initiative, we were able to move up to about 1.4. Um, but what's the payoff of that? What's the goal of what we wanted for more cops? Safest city in America. Um, those are the recognition that the city of Henderson has got consistently over the past several years. Uh, we want to keep that. We've noticed uh, what, what, what does the safest community bring you? It brings you families that move into your neighborhoods. It brings you businesses back into your community. Um, you know, we want to keep that for the folks. Um, you know, and it takes a lot of uh, partnerships to go along with that. It takes a mayor, it takes a city council, a city manager that support public safety. It takes the partnerships of those law enforcement agencies that are in this room today that we support, Las Vegas Metro and North Las Vegas and Mesquite and Boulder City. Uh, we support them in need, including federal agencies out of Lake Mead when they need help. Um, unfortunately, today we've seen as communities or families come to the, our community, population increases, demands increase. Uh, unfortunately, our staffing numbers have decreased. Uh, we, we see crime starting to inch up. We see case closures starting to take longer and longer. And uh, the thing we want to do is maintain being one of the safest communities in America. I think that was the payoff. I think that was the goal uh, that wanted to be achieved by more cops. Um, a lot of folks ask, you know, does it make a difference for one cop, 50 cops, 100 cops? It does, and it has in the city of Henderson. Uh, in Mesquite and Boulder City, they may only get one or two officers out of the More Cops initiative, but, you know, 22 years ago when I took my oath, I said, hey, I'm going to make a difference in the community. That's what's done by every police officer that I see coming out of our academy. So whether it's one officer or 40 officers for the city of Henderson, they make a difference, and that difference can be can be changed today by the difference you guys can make in that. So I appreciate your support and the time I got to speak to you. Thank you, Chief. Hi, my name is Ella Brewer. I'm, I'm here to support uh, Sheriff Gillespie. I truly believe that they need the tax. We need the protection. My concern is, say for instance, someone is breaking in my home. I call 911. Okay, we'll have an officer out there. The officer comes 15, 20 minutes later, I'm dead on the floor. Why? Because they did not have enough officers. We need to protect our children, the, the elderly, the uh, uh, visitors that come in here. What if there's a mass shooting? Like there was in Denver. We're not going to get the tourism, the people come here to visit. No, you don't want to go to Vegas. So let's, let's just uh, uh, support this for six cents a day. We truly need more officers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, yes, sir. My name is Richard Lozo, L-O-Z-O. I think that the problem lies in accountability and in accounting, and as one gentleman said, about making sure that the money is used in the right way and in the right places. I agree with the articles that I read from Commissioner Sisolak that he's not approving this, and I can see why. I agree with the article that Susan Brager had about saying She's going to cut it down because Gillespie and, uh, not Gillespie, but the Sheriff's Department has a surplus of $124 million. I get a little disappointed in things that the paper talks about, the radio talks about, TV talks about, because all the facts are either wrong, they're not true, or whatever. March of this last year, it said in the paper here that there were a hundred, almost 200 officers in the Metro Police Department that got over $200,000 a year. 
Wow, is that true? If that's true, that figure comes to $30 million. $30 million that the sheriffs got, that the paper says that they got for that one year. Where is the accountability and whatever are they doing to see, to curb the expenses, and how are these guys getting all of that money? If you took as an average salary for a police officer, and I think of 40 or 50,000, they start at 50,000. All the facts are not put out. They don't tell how many policemen that they have, what the starting salary is, what the, what the senior officers get, etc. The money is being put around there, and they have enough money right now to hire over 200 policemen on the surplus that they have. I understand that their budget is about $60 million, but they say, or excuse me, $66 million, and they're only taking in $60 million. There's $6 million in the hole every year. That's what I hear. Well, if there's $6 million in the hole, somebody's got to sit down and say, hey, we got to cut this expense, we got to cut this or cut that to get back down to what's coming in and what we pay. Everybody that's in a house nowadays, if they're getting $3,000 income coming into their house, they can't spend 4000 They have to keep the thing downward below. I believe they have the money there. And I'm really saying to the council, take a good look at it. Don't vote on it today. Put it aside for a while and take a look to see if what I'm telling you is the truth, there's something wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Schlossel. Yes, my name is Ed Euling. And even though I raised my hand that I was going to talk and I wanted to talk, I wasn't serious. But when the man comes up here and says, oh, Look at all the problems we have in North Las Vegas, uh, the lack of security we have in North Las Vegas. It was the police department and the fire department who caused the bankruptcy of North Las Vegas. That's what happened. And, and the same thing is going to happen here. We're spending $500 million a year on Metro, and it's not enough to have, uh, to have uh, a public peace well, I'm glad the other person mentioned Los Angeles and Los Angeles County. I have some familiarity with Los Angeles County since I started, uh, since I invested in hundreds of homes in, uh, in South Los Angeles uh, in the 70s and 80s. And when Daryl Gates became the police commissioner, uh, as if the previous ones weren't bad enough, it became obvious that he was, with his treatment of the people, of the black people and of the, uh, of the Latinos moving into Los Angeles, it was obvious that he was raising the level of anger of the people in, the, in that city. And if, if you go back, that is the cause of the crime in Los Angeles, the high level of crime in Los Angeles. Where, uh, they don't... Uh, they don't help public safety. We're dealing, that's true. The main issue is public safety. Do they create public unsafety or do they create public safety? And when the police department comes in and acts as an occupying army, they create insecurity. They, they don't uh, contribute to public safety. And when, when our department is shooting up, uh, is killing, is, uh, is number three in the whole country in the number of people killed, when our department is, it has police cars all over the place, not for public safety, but to, to collect money for the government uh, at every corner, uh, th that's not public safety. When our police department is, is, uh, is pulling over mainly uh, uh, minority people and good-looking women and, uh, and young people and throwing them down on the sidewalk, and putting handcuffs on them and mistreating them, this raises the level of anger with people. People get angry with this sort of behavior. When, when these kids are being stopped on the street and asked questions and having their picture taken as if they're some kind of criminals, uh, it causes, it causes, it isn't contributing to public safety. It's the opposite. 
when, uh, in fact, the statistic is any kid that has an interaction with the police department uh, it, it, when he's young, it, it, almost certainly he's going to become a criminal later in his life. They contribute to crime. They don't solve it. Good afternoon, Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Terry Murphy, 516 South 6th Street. I'm here representing the Downtown Las Vegas Alliance, as well as Mr. Irwin Mulaski and Rich Worthington, President of the Mulaski Companies. Um, our number one priority on the Downtown Alliance, which rep is representing small and large businesses who contribute to Metro, is public safety. We want our residents and our tourists to feel safe when they come downtown. We supported the 0.25 cent increase with the sheriff up in the legislature. Mr. Mulaski was here last month to support the 0.15 uh, cent increase. However, we appreciate sincerely the due diligence that you all have done as a board. Um, our primary concern is that something gets passed today. The reason for that is that we face, we work very closely with Metro on a daily basis out on the street with our downtown area commander. We see the issues that they face and um, we respect the burden of this decision that you face and we appreciate your hard work and dedication on it. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. My name is Rolando Larraz. I am at 820 East Charleston. I own the LasVegasTribune.com and RadioTribune.com. Most of the information that I got here is only hearsay because uh, both of my organization has been discriminated by Sheriff Gillespie from day one when he took office, and I'm not pride to any of that information the other newspapers carry. I have to depend on sources within the police department. But I believe that most of the stuff that are here, you know, like the man that said then uh, Mrs. Dixon would be alive, it would be more cops. If uh, the other guy is complaining about something else, uh, you know, there is nine detectives working in the Police Protective Association making a, a detective salary with almost $200,000 each. They could be out there in the street patrolling the streets. There is nine PIO office, but, uh, uh, a public information officer. You guys don't have nine police, uh, uh, a public information officer, and you are a bigger organization making also a salary. They got 19 executive directors making over $200,000 a year. Probably, you know, like the P, like a PIO, they got a female civilian working as a, giving orders and bossing around professional in police officers with integrity and experience. And you have a civilian that came from Channel 8 to work as a public information officer making $200,000. Those people can be out there in the street patrolling the street. It's not only that. If the charity want more money, what he should do is use the, en the energy that he's using with you guys over here and go to the casinos and lobby to the casinos to allow lottery to come to, to, to Nevada. Lottery can produce a lot of money in this town for the school, for police, and for everybody else. But the sheriff wants to get the money from you because you are the one that listen because with the exception of the chairman of this board, I don't think anybody else care about the community and this board. I wasn't even going to talk about it today because uh, all of you received the 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 Las Vegas Tribune online, I guarantee you, you don't know what the last editorial says because you don't read it. You don't have time for the little paper. You have to kiss the butt of the big paper, the only paper we got in town now. That's what it is. The sheriff need to push his priority first. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello. 
My name is Celia Olson, and I'm a resident of Las Vegas, and I love living in Las Vegas. I'm also a senior, and uh, I'm one of those victims. I'm one of those people that my house got broke into. Um, they took a lot of my precious things, my belongings, things that I really treasure, but that wasn't it. Th those things can get replaced. But what they took away from me was the feeling of feeling safe. I will never, never feel safe. I always thought that I would feel safe in my home. No, that's not true. They broke in, and, and they were able to get in and take all these things, and I have never, have never felt so full of fear. And when I'm driving on the highway, an innocent driver, going to get a prescription or getting groceries, I see these people in a rush and crossing the white lines, which tells you do not cross that white line because somebody might be exiting, and it, it, it's, it's a, a fear. And the reason I wanted to represent myself here is that we need more cops to help us keep the safety of our town. Never mind the money. The money is always there. Dig in your pockets, the money comes up, and we can afford to hire more cops. It's our safety. Nothing is more precious than our lives, all of our lives. This is more precious. You can never replace that. For moms, for dads, for brothers, for daughters, for the service people that are helping our country. We need our safety above everything else. That's the quality. I'm so glad that I was able to come here and speak and represent my feelings. And I thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Seeing and hearing none, I want to thank everyone for participating in the public hearing and for their comments. At this time, I will close this portion of the public hearing. Ask Chair of Gillespie if you would like to address any of the uh, comments that were made or he had any further comments before I turn it over to the board. Chair? Now, I, I don't expect you to answer every question that was posed by the people at Rothfeld. I, I won't be doing that, sir. Um, but, but I will uh, uh, touch on a few, and, and, and I believe some of them um, sort of come together in some of the comments made by the, um, uh, the public this morning. Um, first is in regards to um, the officers themselves. Um, in today's society, we look at a lot of things to improve our efficiency uh, through technology. Uh, but in our business, truly the one thing that you can't improve upon in regards to its effectiveness is the men and women in neighborhoods wearing this uniform or one very similar to it operating in a marked vehicle. It impacts crime. Every study that's been done, when I went to college to study to become a police officer, that's what you learned. It was a Kansas City study done many years ago, um, and it shows the effectiveness of police officers that aren't call driven, that have some free time, um, and they're able to interact with the community. When they see something suspicious, stop it. When they see that person running that red light, they're not going to a call that they stop it. They truly make a difference. And as we move forward on, on this discussion, because I don't believe this discussion will end today, um, it will continue, not just maybe about this sales tax, but uh, funding policing in general will continue. Um, we need to keep that in mind. The other part of it is um, the public thinks very highly of law enforcement here in Southern Nevada. And I know that for a fact. Um, because I've been a part of it for 33 years. And I can tell you one of the things that you probably all do, like I do or I did uh, when I was seeking elected office, is you do a fair amount of polling. And you know what? If you find a good pollster, they're worth every nickel that you pay them. And I believe I had one of the best prior to and during. And every time I polled this police department, its favorability, was the high 70s. It would fluctuate between 76 to 78 percent approval rating. And the interesting part of that was 
The person that managed my campaign during the years said that was very consistent for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, which I think speaks volumes when you're talking about what the community thinks of the officers. The other part of that polling is every time that I have polled this community, now I don't give them the answers when I poll them, they're open-ended. The top of that polling every time, what do you want? What's your expectation? It's cops in my neighborhood. When our ratio shrinks like it has, like it has in prior years when funding hasn't been there, that's what gets reduced. Those cops get pulled out of those neighborhoods. They get pulled into the higher crime aspects, the call driving aspects of what it is that we do in policing, the special events that occur, the unanticipated drain on your resources. Uh, those are where those bodies go. And here in the Las Vegas Valley, we have the most unique policing aspects of any in America. When I talk to my peers and my colleagues nationally, none of them can compare in regards to the diverse aspects of what it is and how it is that we police and manage police resources in this particular valley. So please, I'm not just up here trying to scare you with a, with a ratio or crime numbers and stuff. Um, I firmly believe those are the issues on the table. And I firmly believe that we need as much revenue that we possibly can to come into the organization to turn that particular tide. In regards to the cameras, I have had many conversations with the NAACP, NAACP and the ACLU as well as others on this particular issue. There has always been the issue of the union's willingness to accept um, the cameras. And rather than go to litigation with the unions, I did have a conversation with them and I said I would not mandate it. Why? I didn't want to get it caught up in litigation. It get delayed two or three years down the road. So I committed to the voluntary uh, implementation of that program. And I believe you me, uh, Frank Hawkins, Richard Bulware, Alan Lichtenstein, Dane Clawson, before he left, they all knew um, about that voluntary aspect of it. But I will tell you this, I believe there will be a high percentage of participation in that program when it's funded and it's operational. Why? Because officers have seen the benefits of them. They have. It's not as widespread through American policing as maybe some would like you to believe in regards to the on-body cameras. It's a fairly new technology met with a lot of issues associated with that technology. But we are moving forward. We're moving forward on funding for 200 cameras. We were just approved uh, on a grant for an additional 200 cameras. We have already gone through procurement uh, for the infrastructure necessary to implement the program at Bolden Area Command as well as Northeast Area Command. And we will continue to move forward on that project. And why those two area commands? That was in partnership with the NAACP and the ACLU as to where they wanted to see the pilot project, the initial camera deployments uh, to take place. Last but not least, I just want to say to you all, I understand this is not an easy decision. A number of you, if I have had some, a number of conversations, um, I do my best uh, to stay above the fray and not make it personal. But I gotta tell you folks, I believe my organization has truly been a partner in dealing with the downturn in the economy. I believe we have brought you a solution, a potential solution to that $30 million shortfall, as well as adding some positions. Knowing full well some of the other deficits that you as a commission have to tackle, I believe it's in the best interest of public safety to approve the 0.15. Be happy to answer any questions that you might have of me. Thank you, Sheriff. With that, I appreciate your comments, and uh, I will turn over to commissioners for questions and comments. Who would like to start? Commissioner Collins. I'm going to go through the entire board one time before, so try to get them all in. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Sheriff. I was glad to see uh, the chiefs of police. Maybe, you know, maybe we should add the mayors of those cities here. But there's no doubt about, and it's been presented to this board in the past, we in Clark County make hundreds, over hundreds, of, over thousands of runs into our neighbors with our fire department and the Metropolitan Police Department assisting Henderson and North Las Vegas, as well as Mesquite. There's a great relationship with our officers in the Moapa Valley in Northeast Clark County and Bunkerville and the Mesquite Police Department. Tremendous cooperation, and it makes a difference, as uh, Senator Hardy mentioned about the uh, city of Mesquite, uh, border city. I can tell you, driving out there many, many times, and I also noticed, but not as much when I traveled to California, the Metropolitan Police Department, the Nevada Highway Patrol, and the ATF and DEA working the interstate, both going to Utah and going to California in cooperation. And we have to have that cooperation. I've also noticed a tremendous increase in the port of entry out there by Apex Open so that we can address safe buses and trucks and other commercial equipment that comes through in, through our valley so that our valley is safer because it's checked and inspected before it enters. And that takes cooperation of all these law enforcement agencies. The reduction in law enforcement around our community has made a dramatic effect on the changes in law enforcement. And I want to share some things, and if you're, I, I hope that you're going to allow some additional comments as, as issues arise here. We've been doing this for months. But on December 18th of 2012, five members of this Clark County Commission approved 25 cents in a resolution format to support public safety. And there were tremendous comments made by some of the board members here. Um, that for the last two years prior to that date, crime was the number one issue. Public safety was the number one issue. That statement was made repeatedly. And another comment was that making sure we do what's right for a full community. In other words, a commissioner was speaking about all of Clark County, Mesquite, Boulder City, Henderson, Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, and the unincorporated areas. Now, I voted for that 25 cent resolution, and I'm going to keep my commitment for public safety. The legislature allowed us 15 cents, and I will support the resolution for 15 cents, excuse me, the ordinance for 15 cents. Now, I know there's a lot of commissioners who want to speak about all the things that are going on here. Um, and I, as a sheriff, man, I will stay out of the personal fray here because I believe there's two issues here that are not being spoke about, and I probably won't, I don't want to speak about them either. Um, Mr. Chairman, at any time you're ready, I'd make a motion to approve our bill number 9-17-13. I'm not taking a motion at this time, Commissioner. One everybody. Um, I will conclude my comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I'm not seeing any hands go up. I've, nobody else has any questions? I've got some questions if no one else does. Commissioner Drew Kiliani. Thank you. I've been trying to make some notes to myself because I really did, even though I believe that the sales tax is extremely regressive and I've been consistent about that both in the legislature as well as here, it's about making sure that we have the ability to put police officers on the street and specifically in our neighborhoods and nothing against the strip. You have events and you have programs and that and maybe we have to find a better way of budgeting for overtime and some things along those lines so we don't pit community against tourists because you need the tourists to generate the revenue. That said, one of the things that we did in 05 in the legislature was add an 80 percent threshold to make sure that the police were dedicated to um, being in neighborhoods. Today is not, you know, it's a culmination. I was trying to get there. Um, 
I still remember when I, in the 90s, when I was in the legislature, I took on my own governor, my own party, and my own leadership to make sure that we didn't lose heart and lung uh, coverage for our police officers. Um, I've always supported our police and still, still will no matter what. People may think, use your term, that I'm a skeptic. No, I, I believe that I have a job in this position, and that is no matter if it's the department, fire, teaching, whatever, that we have a responsibility to query and ask questions and to know where, what the answers were. I was hoping that we had done some town halls because that had been something that was raised at the last meeting, but I don't believe, I don't, did your department hold any share? I did not. Okay. But I wanted to go back because everybody says, oh, it was a mandate, it was a mandate. First of all, it was an advisory question uh, that was done in 04. And because I'm weird this way, I pulled the, the original voting uh, record. Unfortunately, it failed in Boulder City, in Henderson, in Mesquite, and in North Las no, it passed in North Las Vegas. It passed and incorporated Clark County, Las Vegas, and North Las Vegas by a total of 25,000 votes. Um, and that said, it passed, but it was not the overwhelming mandate. I almost wish, bless you, that we could have gone back and really done a better analysis now in 2013 of what is our community expectations, where do they want our officers to be deployed, what kind of training, so that we get past um, the 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 feeling that in some cases, and very few, I believe the majority of our officers, overwhelming majority, are wonderful, hardworking, dedicated, professional public employees. There's a few that ruin it for everybody, and I think part of that is we have to rebuild that um, relationship. That said, there are some things that came about. We were under pressure that we had to do this within 60 days. And I went back to the bill and it says actually the date on which that increased rate is first imposed is on or after October 1st, 2013, today, and as long as it's before July 1st of 2016. Um, I think that there are budgetary issues. Our staff just issued an unaudited audit of um, what was expended this past year. And it, it was uh, actually there was about a $9 million deposit made into the, um, the, tr the uh, reserve account because you were frugal, and we appreciate that part of it. There are people that said the city and the county haven't paid their fair share. Well, city put in $119 million, the county put in $198 million um, in addition to the sales tax. And I think that that needs to be noted, that we're trying to do what we can to support our department. Um, part of what's never been answered for me is what is the intent of this tax to do? Is it to fix a structural deficit and fill a hole? or is it to actually put police officers in the street? Or is it to do the former and then the latter? I think that the jury's still out, so to speak, in my mind, on what this is really intended to still do. It is entitled more cops, and it means more cops mostly in neighborhoods and making sure that we've got training for them and support mechanisms for them. But we're not, that's not been the conversation. I. I we, we had a downturn in this community. I think part of the problem, and I think the sheriff wouldn't even argue with me on this part of it, is that our property tax cap really hurt a lot of local governments, including you all, and that structurally, legislature, we need to do something about that because you, we will not fix this hole, and that is a far more stable, fair, less regressive tax. And maybe it's removing the cap, maybe it's modifying it, maybe it's doing some fluctuations within, but that conversation has to occur regardless of what happens on today vote. Um, I appreciate knowing about the cameras. I was on the original committee that worked with ACLU and AACP and a variety of community people, and not once did anybody ever tell me about volunteerism, with no disrespect to Chris and PPA. And the union has every right to negotiate and bargain salaries, and that's part of their responsibility, and that's their job to do. And I, I would never question that part. Might question how you get there, but not about the fact that people don't deserve a salary increase. Um, that said, that's disappointing to me because I think that under the guise of transparency, there was an opportunity. Um, and, and with no disrespect, I read the contract language as well, and I don't believe that body cameras were a part of the negotiations. But you know, it'll, we'll have that argument over another argument. Could you clarify those still? When, when the department took the 2010 numbers and said that you were short 250 officers, that's absolutely correct. But if you go back to when our downturn, which is what we've all tried to measure that on, which is 28, I come up with 18 different officers. Tell me what I'm missing there. 
the increased number of officers to us, to our peak in 10, was more COPS officers. They were not general fund officers. We were still hiring more COPS officers during that time period. And in my interactions with county staff, city staff, or anyone else, we've always talked about our peak uh, times when t people are talking about position eliminations. And actually, we've eliminated 426 police officer positions. Right, but there were luckily no cuts, because I believe in your testimony because in Carson City. Because of good city. planning, Commissioner, yes. Correct. You're right. We yeah. did not have to lay anybody off. Yeah, we did not lay anyone off in the Las Correct. Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. These are positions that were vacant or became vac vacant through attrition that we eliminated through the budget process. Part of it is, as we look as a government. Well, I would like to clarify that point just okay. for a minute, if I may, Commissioner. Um, some of these positions were not filled. Uh, we looked into the future. My discussions with county management as well as city was they were, you know, we start our discussions today for an implementation of a budget in July of 14. So when folks start telling you mm -hmm. this time of the year that come to this time next year, you're not going to have this amount of money, I don't want to hire people today that you end up having to lay off in six, eight, or 10, or 12 months. So I don't want to give the impression that they were, they were all filled. I go back to the conversation we all had when the North Valley complex of the Clark County Detention Center uh, was built and was ready to be opened. Uh, but the, the, the issue came up at that point in time. We've got the funding today for those positions, but we don't believe we're going to have the funding to stay committed to those positions in the, the future budget cycle. Um, you know, Sheriff, would you consider not filling those? And I agreed. I don't want to hire people that down the road. It, it, it's very difficult. You know, I'm not saying it's easy in any profession, but when you put the amount of time um, and effort and funding into training those individuals, you sure as heck don't want to lose them, you know, 10, 12 months down the road. Okay. And that's very valid, and, and any business needs to look at that. You've got your cost of training of employees generally one year, and it takes you three years to recapture that. So you don't want to get there. Plus, you don't want good men and women going by the wayside if that's the case. That said, our biggest downturn started in 28, and all the other local governments looked at not only laying off or vacating, but we limited positions. And Luckily, you weren't faced with that part of it. Um, and, and that's still where I have to go to as far as on the prudent side of it. What really are we trying to fill? What, in your mind, would either the 0.15 or the 0.75 do for your budget? Is it fixing the structural deficit? Is it fixing plugging a hole? Bless you. Or is it actually putting people on the street? The 0.15 would do both. The 0.15 would generate enough revenue to fill the current $30 million shortfall. I agree with what you said about the $9 million uh, that we have extra today, uh, knowing full well that we don't incur any unforeseen costs um, you know, during this current fiscal year that would impact that number um, as well. But we would evaluate, of course, what that deficit is that that money there would go towards that deficit, but it would be police officer positions, okay? We would not use it for other things. It would be for those police officer positions, but it would remove that financial uh, obligation uh, in, in that 30 million. And then we believe we'd be able to hire 100 additional officers um, off of that 0.15. So you would see that filled and, and, and additional officers. Um, the point zero seven five um, doesn't get us there on either front. It, it's its funding is is limited. It's it's half, of course, of what is uh, the point one five. So it wouldn't fill our deficit and would not provide us the ability to hire additional people. And for the one hundred officers. Because I think the 0.15 generated about 58 million. The correct. The 0.15 generated about 58. Million? No, 30 to 33. The 0.15. Okay, so then the quarter was uh, estimated to be in the 50 million dollar okay, range. Okay, the quarter was the 58 that I had in my mind. So then the 15 was 30 to 33. 
you would plug your deficit and be able to hire over what period of time 100 officers? Three years. Now, if the tax performs better um, or um, we have savings, um, you know, as we go through this year that we can put towards the deficit or the city and the county uh, can come up with an added, you know, increased funding level, um, then I believe you'd be able to add to that 100. See, anything that we could add to the process would be able to increase the numbers, uh, the amount of money we would have to use on whether it's 15 million or 30 million. And that is always our, we do these things in isolation without looking at the impact. I mean, for every police officer we put on the street, that's probably somebody that gets written up, then it means another PD and a DA, then you have an impact on the courts, and then we need more judges. And so we do things in a vacuum, and we do things, unfortunately, with taxes in a very isolated way that doesn't help the rest of the people that are paying the majority of taxes for other programming needs. And that's got to be something we look at as a regional um, body, I guess, in the long run. Um, but if you're, if we're, the, you know, when we look at this long term, Commissioner, um, we see a reduction. So you see a reduced impact on those services. Um, and I, I believe one of the things that we've been able to do um, at local government uh, because of that is to have some of those services, uh, whether it's internally or externally, focused on our at-risk uh, population so we uh, impact the number of people that get in trouble in a more positive way. Um, whether it's after-school programs that officers are able to participate in uh, and, and a variety of other things. I mean, we've seen the fruits of those efforts, but they take a while. It, it doesn't happen quickly. And there's also this uh, delayed effect. You know, if, if we authorize today so many officers to be hired, um, literally, we don't see the benefit for them for a year. Right, because you have to go uh, And an actual impact, what they provide to crime, um, is projected even further out than that. And then you see the same thing with crime. When you start reducing those numbers, you don't immediately see the impact um, from the criminal element. Uh, but over time, then you, then you start to. That's why when you're looking at some of this stuff, when you, when you look at, like at, at us as an organization, uh, when we were peak authorized at a certain year, um, you've got to look, uh, did that authorization stay? Were those positions filled? And, and, and what were the impacts of those? Because even though we peaked it at, during those budget years that we're talking about, 9, 10, we started making cuts. Uh, to those numbers uh, okay. not long after that. And, and you mentioned about crime statistics, and, and we are starting to uptick in a few areas, and that's unfortunate. But if you look, I started doing my own research, and I, I'm finding that there's been a trend worldwide, unfortunately, that's called what, age, um, age relationship. And that as, unfortunately, your age of youth, 18 to 24, tend to hit high, your crime stats start to go up. And then if you don't couple, as you're mentioning, some of the social benefits, education, parental stability, jobs, and economics, then you will continue to see that escalation. And then as that age starts to decline, your crime statistics start to go back down. We have a young population that's growing in this community that may be contributing to those numbers. And that's just for a future discussion. We really have to look at, um, as a community, not isolating young people, making sure that we have benefits for them to do, that we don't over-label them and arrest them and put them into the system, especially our, our young people of color. So there's a lot of issues out there, but I don't believe whether or not it's just be, whether we adopt more sales tax, that that will directly equate to the, the increase and or reduction of crime because there's been a pretty much a stable um, analysis that's been done on that part of it. Um, and I appreciated Mesquite's uh, testimony in the rural counties, even though you guys voted it down. But um, I, I think I, when, I, w I was not aware of this, but when the amendment was done and proposed, I believe, by the department, it was to make it only the county commission to vote on it and only by a two-thirds vote. And so I think originally the other jurisdictions no, could have weighed in on it. We didn't promote that. Oh, then you better get the minutes corrected very truthfully from the legislature because it said that it was your, uh, you offered well, the amendment. So. Now I, I can tell you this, Commissioner. Uh, I was uh, an advocate for the quarter. 
I was not an advocate for the reduction of that. Okay. I was an advocate for the process that was used in 2005 for that process to be used in 2013. When you start changing those processes, I think that's what creates um, some of the uh, confusion or concerns that you have because you're not treating it the same. Okay, because it makes it on April 2nd, 2013, page 26. You might want to go ahead and correct it then because it says uh, under the initial bill, that's correct. Uh, or just for clarification, under, upon passage, this will go to the county commission and other entities for their own municipal governing bodies for approval. Is that correct? Under the initial bill, that is correct. Our amendment is that it go to the county commission only for two-thirds majority vote. That would then enable the tax. And this, we want to follow the similar protocol, which is exactly what you just said. But the lead-in originally was to anticipate having each of the jurisdictions um, vote on it in the original bill draft. Um, but so maybe there's part, part, maybe they need to flip how they did it. But in looking at the minutes, it, it kind of um, caught my eye. Um, finally, for right now, um, I wish you'd help. I, I, well, I'm only one vote, so you know, be that as it may. I um, I appreciate you being here today and at all the meetings that we've had and then we'll just see where this conversation goes. I almost wish we weren't acting on either one today and we actually said go fill your budget hole with your reserves that you got. Come back and talk to us then about putting police officers on the street, a plan for transparency, true transparency, and then I think you can get there. I, I, I just don't think that that part of the financial planning has occurred. I mean, even fiscal affairs, there's there's language out there that I don't know that's been vetted even that's come to them, whether it's on your the arbitration language or if it's on um, just how how the budget is comprised. We get what you send, and maybe we have to do a better job of an analyzing what we get from the various groups, whether it's courts, metro, or whatnot, and to say, what's your plan for doing business differently? Where do we direct our dollars for the best impact for the community and, and safety for your officers that are on the streets as well? What equipment do they need? All those things, and we never really have that kind of a conversation. It's just, here's the dollar amount, this is what we want, and, and we don't get to vet it as much. But I'll, I'll listen to the rest of my colleagues and, and, and just wanted to say thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Commissioner Weekly. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheriff, um, I too want to thank you very much because we've had some very candid conversations and I thank you so much for sharing you know the information and answering a whole lot of questions I've seen a lot of uh, correspondence going back and forth with some really good questions in terms of uh, the reserves to um, attrition to you name it and um, you've been very responsive and you know been a, a, a straight shooter at, well let me rephrase let me rephrase straight shooter I'd say um, Probably above the fray, how about I that? that world, yeah. I'll use your word, above the fray, how about that? Thank you. All right, okay. Um, let me ask this in terms of, uh, earlier you spoke about um, the point fifteen and the um, point zero seven five, um, and you mentioned the um, six cents, 42 cents, a dollar 88 cents, and $22.58 a year. Um, just for clarifications, which option does that um, apply to, the 15 or the uh, 0 0.75? The 15, the 15. 0.15. That's 0 0.15, okay. And then secondly, um, I want to know, um, with some of the other municipalities that spoke earlier as well, um, how this would support them. If, in fact, um, how does this, the 15, the point one five support the other municipalities as well as the 0 0.75? If you can put some clarification on the record for that, too, for our viewers out there. And I ask that question because I have a, a pretty unique district where, you know, I encompass city of Las Vegas as well as North Las Vegas. And um, I heard a gentleman speak earlier in reference to some of the concerns in North Las Vegas, and it's a huge concern um, for a number of the constituents out there in terms of public safety. So sure. If you could you want me to ask those? I apologize, Chris. You want me to ask those chiefs to come up? No, I, no, he can give some clarification. They would be able to add positions under the point one five, Commissioner, um, and uh, you know they don't have uh, the, re, the the account. Um, fund balance uh, that's been talked about uh, that we have um, in ours, uh, but uh, it would afford them the opportunity to add additional people. Okay. And then um, one of the other comments that I had written down, um, I, was, I was kind of a bit disheartened myself. Um, you had spoken, uh, my friend here, Mr. Collins, who uh, one of my former 
Western High School graduates here um, to uh, spoke about the unwillingness to accept the cameras. Um, I guess I too um, didn't know about the voluntary type thing. Um, and as we were all out talking about this to constituents, um, that's, that's kind of a little disheartening to hear um, that that's on a voluntary basis, and I don't know if you'd like to speak to it, or Mr. Chair, is it, is it okay if I ask Mr. Collins um, just for a clarification on the record? Please. Mr. Collins is welcome to come Mr. Down Collins, can I just ask you one question, like please? And, and the reason I'd like to ask you this, uh, Ms. Collins, is because, again, um, you know, with the number of outreach meetings that I've had, and I, one of the ladies spoke about some neighborhood meetings. I mean, I know I've had a number of meetings. Um, my, my captain over at the North Northeast Area Command, we had uh, police pastors and pancakes. And um, we, we came together with a group of um, those from the faith-based community as well as residents. And we t this was one of the issues that a number of um, those constituents had spoken about. And I guess the voluntary word um, just never came up in those conversations. And I never spoke to that because I, I never knew that that's what it was based on a voluntary basis. And being that Bolden and Northeast Area Command are located in my district, you know, which I stand proud to represent um, because both of the um, both of those commands have, are just doing a tremendous job as it relates to restoring faith back in the community. Um, I, I can't tell you, um, especially from the Bolden standpoint, um, what they've done, um, Captain Burns and his whole crew, uh, with Safe Village. You talk about restoring faith and confidence in law enforcement. You know, when you have kids, um, and I, I see a number of officers here, and I know a whole lot of them who do a fantastic job when they're not only at work, but when they're off, off duty, they come back and give back in the community. Many of these men and women are tutoring um, from PAL program, you name it. And so, I, you know, it's kind of one of those, your heart dropped when, when I heard that because I think people are really working, Sheriff and, and Ms. Collins, wanting to just restore that faith because I understand being in public safety, um, it's not an easy job. And I know those men and women, when they're out there, hell, they want to go home to their families as well. And we want to see that happen also, too, because it's some, some, some bad boys and some bad girls out there on the streets. But I, I don't know anybody who dials 911 would not want an, a law enforcement officer to show up. But I also, too, as I said the last time, I don't know anybody out there that pays taxes want to be afraid of their law, their law enforcement. So if you could give some clarification for many of my constituents who are watching, because that was very important to them. I appreciate your willingness, Mr. Collins, to step forward. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Weekly, um, what happened on the camera issue was, as the department embarked on the, um, the experiment, I guess, if you will, you know, to test the cameras to see if they were a viable option, that became aware to the union through the officers who had been asked to wear them. Uh, I have a legal team, just like all the unions do. My legal team brought notice to me that they believe that was a change in the condition of their employment, which per Nevada statute is a mandatory subject of bargaining. We explained to the sheriff that we did not uh, believe he had the uh, right under the statute to simply mandate the wearing of the cameras, that we were willing to sit down and negotiate. We had several meetings. Uh, his staff uh, was very cordial. Uh, we were cordial. Um, this issue came up, I believe it was in 2008 or 9, over the bulletproof vest issue. And in essence, what happened is we came to the very same resolution. Uh, for new hires, you can make the camera condition of employment. The union has nothing to do with that. Uh, I believe that's where the, the July 13 date came from, and that all other officers could wear them if they chose to. Now, we also said in a meeting that we were not going to allow the officers to say, yes, I want a camera, and have the department go to the expense of buying a camera and then say two weeks later, you know, I, I don't want this camera, I've changed my mind. We said the department, if an officer volunteers to wear a camera, they'll have to wear that camera for a minimum of one year so that they can see that it has some benefit or not. I agree with the comments of Commissioner G. We have a young police department. Uh, they are tech savvy. I think you'll find that a great number of them will volunteer. It certainly will not be 100%. Some of the older officers like myself who are, are not tech savvy, I can't work my smartphone, uh, are going to say, no, I don't want to wear it. And, and it, for total disclosure, one of the biggest issues for us was how long are you going to preserve the film that is shot on those cameras? Because one of the things that can clearly come out of those cameras that is a benefit to the officers is when a, when a complaint is made, the film will 
clear them of any wrongdoing, and it would certainly uh, prove that wrongdoing had been done as well. That would shorten up IAB investigations, shorten up a lot of man hours, and make the department a little more efficient. What we asked was that uh, to come to some understanding of how long it would be kept because we don't want a citizen to come in and make a complaint, and this is obviously a made-up date, but let's say that a citizen made a store film for 30 days. And on day 31, have someone come in and make a complaint against the officer knowing that the film that would have cleared the officer has now been destroyed, and we simply now have back to where we were, uh, he said, she said, investigations happening. And that was one of the issues we, that, you know, we could not resolve, quite honestly. So um, I, I think that the resolution was fair. I think the sheriff uh, understood our issue. We, we tried to understand his and came to the best resolution we could for everyone. And like I said, I truly believe, uh, after speaking to Captain Burns and the men and women at his station, that you will see the vast majority of the officers volunteer to wear the camera. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Um, Sheriff, uh, I guess one final question that I have for you is, having said that, um, what, do, what do we say to, to those out there who just really thought that this was a, a, a done deal for us? Well, number one, uh, Commissioner, um, nobody committed to the, the whole organization, you know, right away. Uh, yeah. We understand there's significant costs associated with this. Right. I think, like in some of the um, contentious issues that we talk about, um, officer-involved shootings or uh, complaints about discourtesy and, and the timeliness of those investigations and those types of things is um, apply a level of patience uh, and, and please don't look at it as procrastination on, on my part as we move forward on this because I believe like with the cameras, once they're here and officers see them and see the benefits of them and um, they will embrace them. Um, they, they understand much of what they do today is on camera anyway. It's particularly um, in, in some of our um, tourist uh, aspects of, of our community that there's many cameras out there. The other part of it is that we have to be careful about is this is new technology. I know cameras aren't, but this on-body technology is new. And a number of the studies that have been done in regards to police departments are small departments. Um, they don't have the storage issues that we have and, and the archiving. And we're working through those from a policy standpoint, working very closely with Albuquerque, New Mexico. They're probably the largest police department out there that's had a variety of experiences with these. An example I will give you. Albuquerque moved forward on a camera project uh, a couple of years ago. It was voluntary in nature. Um, the camera was here, all right? And what happened was they had a couple of officer-involved shooting encounters, okay? So the officer's arms go out here, all right, with the gun. The camera was blocked. And a number of your cameras on the market are not lapels, are not ears. They're, they're located here. Um, and in really, in some of the most critical incidents that um, we would like to have that video and the community would like to see that video, you wouldn't. Um, and then you have the issue like uh, uh, Chris Collins was talking about from an archiving standpoint. What's that time frame? I believe it was Oakland Police Department implemented a camera program. I also believe that was based uh, partially um, on a consent decree. And they committed to keeping uh, the video, I believe, for a year. They have found out rather quickly that they can't do that. It's, it's sucked up all of their um, storage space in a very short period of time. Now you've got to go to the community and say, well, we said we were going to keep it for a year, but, but now we're not. So we're looking at, from, from our standpoint at Metro, we're looking at, okay, when, does an, um, when is the average... Uh, complaint filed, uh, you know, what is that time frame from, from the incident to when and then extend it out? And we're looking at about a 45 to 60 day time period that we would use to keep um, video of situations where it hasn't been tagged as evidence or something. You know, once we tag it as evidence, of, of course, we have to keep it for the life of that case. So, um, 
I guess that's a long-winded answer to your, your question there, Commissioner. Uh, I believe, if my memory is correct, uh, February of next year we will actually have camera deployment. Yes. Um, and let's see how they, well they work right. uh, under our conditions. Well, as I had indicated to you, Sheriff, in, in our last meeting, um, that, of course, public safety to me is extremely important. Uh, very, very important. Um, uh, but, you know, as I'm out speaking to a number of my constituents, um, whether um, I'm at, out at the PAL programs um, with, uh, with some of the officers or in some of our meetings, um, what I've not heard from a number of, our, of, of my constituents I represent, of course, um, it's an issue for a number of people, taxes, more taxes. Who wants to pay more taxes? But what concerns us the most is that we hear stories about um, um, victims like Ms. Dixie. Um, you know, I heard one of my colleagues say, um, passing the sales tax is not going to add more, bring more safety to our neighborhoods. Um, it's just the um, nature that we live in. Um, but uh, I'll tell you that um, the biggest concerns we, we hear on a continuous basis, of course, and I've, I talk to you regularly about it from a number of people, is racial profiling. It's just huge. It's just a huge concern. And that's, that's totally separate. I, th I think that, you know, those are issues that, whether it's you or whomever the next sheriff is going to be, have to adequately address those, those questions because um, people, are, people are concerned about taxes, but they're more concerned with establishing safe relationships with, with our law enforcement. And so, you know, with that, too, I'll, I'll, I'll wait and, and listen to the rest of the uh, questions from my colleagues here. But thank you very much for the information you provided so far. Thank you, Walt. Thank you, Commissioner Weekly. Commissioner Scow. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, just on the cameras, I'd just like to add my support for that and hope that the um, present officers will voluntarily do that. Seems like it will protect them, them as well as, as add a transparency for the public. Um, Commissioner June Kelliani made a statement that's been, had been ringing through my head as well. Why can't we fill the gap from the reserves and then look at this when we've got till 2016? But as I thought about that and pondered about it and have gotten many, many emails um, requesting information and wanting to ask questions, which I really appreciate how the community has taken a very thoughtful look at this and, and had questions. I've appreciated the emails that I've gotten. I've also appreciated the sheriff being willing to meet and answer questions. Um, but I felt you know, safety is a priority to the community and it does take a year to get those police, police officers in the pipeline. And, and I do feel more officers are preventative. And I think at the end of, at the end result, it does save money. So I felt like I think, I think we do need to do something to have more officers and get that percentage up. So um, I've been inclined to agree with Commissioner Brager's stance that maybe we do half of this and then take a look at this. We'll, we'll have some time to take a look at data and see is the money going to more cops and how's the other side of the budget going as well. I feel like our role here as a county commission is to set parameters for what happens. We can't tell Sheriff Gillespie how to spend his money. He's an elected official also. We do have fiscal affairs um, representatives on, on that committee that we can ask to bring information back to us. But I think our role here is to set parameters and the parameters I would like to see are number one, to see a very transparent, clear budget and work toward a balanced budget. And that's what I've heard from constituents. I want, they want a balanced budget and, and within the means that, that are coming in. And I'd like to see us work toward that and then also have the money go toward not just more cops, but new cops. Will it go toward new cops? Commissioner, um, if you follow maybe my recommendation rather than uh, Commissioner Brager's or uh, the other that the legislature, what I'm saying is authorize the 0.15, all right? that generates enough money uh, to fill the current budget deficit. 
and hire an additional 100 officers, okay? I also say don't take money out of the initial quarter and move it to another account, okay? Potentially creating a deficit where you don't have one right now. Um, what we do is we increase the number of authorized positions in that initial quarter from 549 to 600. Allow us to manage that account over there. We'll hire those additional 51 bodies. But you know what? Over the next two, three, four, five years, if the tax doesn't perform and it doesn't look like it's going to fulfill those positions, um, then we can reduce those number uh, of authorized positions uh, over there. And that initial quarter cent from a transparency standpoint, you folks audited it, and it came back uh, with great reviews. We've got to go to the legislature every two years and have it audited. Not to mention it's looked at every year by fiscal affairs. I don't really know what more oversight um, we could put on that particular account. And it fulfills what the legislature said uh, we could do from the .15, and we don't put off the hiring of people for another six months to a year, depending on when we would bring back the additional .075. Um, that would be needed uh, currently right now to fill the budget deficit. And when I think, as you as commissioners, look at other deficits that you have out there that you're going to have to deal with, uh, from the Clark County Detention Center to, to others that you have spoken to me about, um, I believe this helps us in dealing with those other issues. Uh, because I just don't look at it from the standpoint of, of the sheriff and responsible for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I understand we're part of county government as well as city government as a whole. And we have to look at these other challenges that you have in, in your world and the decisions that you make. And like I said before, if the tax performs better, that frees up more money for more positions. If the city and the county feel as if their contribution levels could increase, uh, maybe not in budget year 1415, but maybe 1516. Um, that would free uh, money up. That would be able to uh, pay for additional positions there um, as well. I, I think what a lot of people look at is that fund balance, and I still would like to see that go to help fill the, the gap and make sure that these officers are new cops, not just filling other positions. So that's, I appreciate your explanation. Okay, but, but I'll, I'll just go back to what I've said before, Commissioner. I've got a $30 million. If we move money, which has been suggested uh, from the initial quarter cent in that fund balance, okay, which I think is a bad term because that account there is to fund those police officers' positions. I don't look at it as extra money. I realize there's a large sum there today, uh, but that large sum is not going to be there uh, for the eternity uh, of that tax. Um, if you take that money out of there and you put it over to fill the $30 million deficit, you're not getting additional police officer positions. You're getting what you got today. And I think I've made a case that what we have today, the $489 million budget that we have today, that you all reduced on me from 502 to 489, okay, is not getting the job done. We are stretched too thin. Thank you. I, um, I still feel the same way. <laughs> Um, I thought maybe I won you over. Just not. <laughs> <laughs> um, we mentioned the uh, smaller cities as well, and I reached out to Henderson, um, to the mayor and the councilman that I share district with, and um, Chief Mers, as we heard from this morning, 
um, and their city council took a, a vote unanimously um, with a re resolution to approve voting for the more cops and um, I know the Henderson police feel that it would be immensely helpful that, to them to have more officers. So I represent about 75% of Henderson and appreciate the feedback from the Henderson folks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Scow. Commissioner Brager. Fun. I just want to say I appreciate our spirited conversations and also with the undersheriff. Um, have had a couple of those. Very interesting to be able to sit with you probably, what, four or five times or in phone calls um, because I do take this seriously. And um, I feel that, and there's two different proposals that are on the table right now, and I have gone over this for months, and we've looked at many different things throughout this whole process. I still am with the 100 and of the 100, that the 0 .075 in this first year, being as that we have till about July of 16, gives you the ability to have about 150 officers, the 0 .075, with what it does. It is does save taxpayers about 24 million, and I think they have a right to that in today's economy. I also believe that this doesn't take the other 0 .075 off the table, but it does give you the ability in the next year to have that transparency that you talk about, to know that I think your officers should be commended. I think that many of your officers work exceptionally hard. I think on a daily basis, getting up and knowing that they don't know what's going to be out there, that any time there isn't an incident, it affects all of us. So I have a high respect. I work with some of your officers. I speak to them. Um, I've stopped and talked to them. Um, all of them know how hard that they work. So that, that's just a given. And I know sometimes when it's a given, they, maybe they don't know how we feel about them. But we know that there are challenges out there. We know that people have um, little respect for life sometimes. And um, the, miss, the lady that was um, gunned down is a terrible situation. So, you know, building on emotion would be very easy, say, do whatever. But I have to use my abilities as a commissioner and I wish it was only 120,000 people. It's about 300,000 we each have that we have a responsibility for. Um, and so I still am going to stay with after Commissioner Collins does his motion that there's an ability for my motion because I don't know where his is going. We sit up here and we come in with thoughts and ideas, but sometimes those change. Mm -hmm. So after Commissioner Collins makes his motion and, and if it passes, then great. And if it doesn't, then I will make mine that I have I actually wrote it out because I feel like it's important to be very concise. I want there to be new officers. I want there to be the ability that we get to two for every thousand citizens. I think that is ultimately important. I think it'll take two to three to four years, as you just said, um, no matter how we go about this. But I think it's essential. I think that looking at the citizen base, looking at when someone said, well, we want you to get closer to 1-5, I came from zero, from zero. To 075. I feel like I've moved a lot. So I know what was said, as Commissioner Collins alluded to earlier, um, my vote, and I will state that here, to go for you to go to Carson City was just for that, that Carson City enabled us to make these decisions that we are taking seriously. And so in giving me that enabling act, I feel like the 075 gives you what you need. Somebody can come back next year. When we do our budget, we have 15, we have 16. We can continue to look at the needs of the department because I think those needs are important. And I have made that when I gave you the documents that I gave you two or three months ago, the commitment that I would continue to work hard to make sure that Metro has what they need in a timely manner, that we look at your budgets, that we know that there's going to be more needs in the future. I've listened to what the city had to say, but I feel very strong in my commitment and my well wishes and well-being that your officers remain safe um, I do think the cameras will make a difference in uh, issues and situations that go on for both sides of that. So that's where I am right now. I will listen to everyone else. I will let Commissioner Collins make his motion first and see if he can acquire the votes that you need. Otherwise, I will make a motion that will be very clear. And hopefully, you will walk away with something today, not nothing. My goal is to give you something, not nothing. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sheriff, I asked recently uh, the purpose of the original More Cops initiative. If, if, you, if you remember, the response was uh, the purpose of the original More Cops initiative. If, if, you, if you remember, the response was uh, under the current funding for Metro, the city, county, and predominantly property tax, uh, and this was into the growth area, that it just wasn't enough. I mean, the More Cops initiative was literally to try to accelerate us on our goal to get to two officers per thousand. Would you agree with that uh, response? Is that part of the reasoning for the original initiative? Uh, yes, I would, Commissioner. Um, I was Bill Young's under sheriff at the time. We submitted a budget request in 2003 that would, re that would um, increase our staffing level to what it was then to the two cops per thousand permanent residents, and there was a number there. City and county made it very clear that they would not be able to come close, short term or long term, and fulfilling that financial need. So the decision was to go out and find uh, additional revenue. Sheriff Moran had to do something very similar under a property tax. Sheriff Keller had to do something very similar uh, under a property tax. When it was calculated, we couldn't raise the initial funds necessary under property tax. So therefore, we went uh, the sales tax uh, route. The question itself was very clear. Um, the first quarter would be enabled in 2005 and the second quarter would be enabled in 2009. I appreciate that because I think that uh, with everything else surrounding this issue, that's fundamental. I mean, this More Cops initiative was reflective of the fact even back then and before city, county, and property tax is not a sustainable or stable enough revenue source for our Metropolitan Police Department. I think that's important. And the comments today, I certainly appreciate them. The, uh, pros and the cons, some of them absolutely on point, some of them uh, flush them down the toilet. Just they're absolutely wrong, the numbers are wrong, but that's okay. It's good and not only today, but the last 90 days. The citizens uh, that have exercised their right to free speech has been pretty remarkable. One of the probably top five issues over the last few years. But one of the things that came out not only in emails, but today and at our last public hearing is Metro, and you in particular, uh, transparency, uh, budgeting, reports, and policies and procedures. And again, I think some of them are sincere in their request. Some of them are ignorant. I mean, all people have to do are show up on the fourth Monday of the month at Fiscal Affairs. It's a public hearing just like this. Now, there aren't TVs, and it's not on TV2 or TV4, but it's about as public and transparent as you'll find any public agency I've been involved with. The, the report, everything's posted on the agenda. We have our annual tentative budget process and anything, and we have a couple citizens participate, but in my experience, anything that's been asked during the public comment period, uh, your staff has either responded to there at the meeting or come back and same with the fiscal affairs board members. So. As far as the transparency, uh, it's, it's in, incorrect. I mean, Metro, if anybody wants to know about Metro, they certainly can find out. And as far as the, the reforms, I think just this week you announced, uh, and certainly there were some officer-involved shootings, there were some uh, incidents with the rock and roll rides and all that. Administratively, you know, that, that has to be taken care of. But it, it takes away from the fundamental issue that's been before us for three months and back through the legislature, and that's how do we fund police officers? And how do we stop the flow, the down, downward spiral of this officer per capita? And that's, with everything else been, that's been raised, some legitimate, some just waste of time, we've lost sight of that. And I would encourage, again, people that want to see how you've run your department, uh, this, uh, I know that Commissioner Sislak and myself and the representatives from the city ask you just about every meeting, what are you doing 
to make the agency more efficient. And that question has been asked at least every other meeting for the past year or longer. And if you remember putting this together, I just stole this from Commissioner Collins, but this is some of the budget reduction highlights that you've done. Very public, uh, very specific, and probably has saved millions of dollars within the agency. Now, is that going to solve the $61 million in property tax that you've lost annually? No. But when people say Metro's out of control, the sheriff needs more oversight, they need to show up at the meetings. They need to take a look at what you have done as the CEO of Metro. I mean, there's a good story to tell. And acknowledging that we have some bad events and bad cops. But I challenge for every bad cop or bad event, event that's happened at Metro during my tenure around here, you'll find 99 events or good cops and we don't read about them. That awards banquet that was held a few months ago to this day will, has left a mark on me because these are the officers that go into the store and get shot at and get shot and injured and hospitalized and possibly crippled that we don't hear about. We don't hear their names mentioned a year after the event or six months after the event. So for every bad event you hear and gets publicized, there's 99 good events to the men and women that wear the uniform. And that, I think, has made Metro what it is today, a first class A1 public agency. And I'm very, very, very supportive of that. But let's get back to the main point about cops. Now today, uh, we could do nothing. We could say legislatively, state, help us, we, we need help. Isn't going to happen. Isn't going to happen. At best, we can ask them to send something back that would enable us to take a vote. And that's two years out, probably even longer. So I think we can take that option off the table. Uh, the, I would like the .25. I would like the .15. I'll take the .075. But I'll take something today. Because here's the, here's the issue with me. If we do nothing, if we don't give you any additional funding to help with these more officers, then we are going to continually drop and fall behind. I, I think... Uh, you have testified that we lose somewhere between 50 to 60 officers per year uh, through attrition or retirement, whatever the case may be. If we do nothing, if we are, are prohibited from getting additional funding to get more officers on, that 1.74 is at best going to stay stable, more likely going to go down even further. And when does it hit a critical point? When does the one police car in North Las Vegas that on a good day gets to drive by a neighborhood every hour or six hours or eight hours. When do we reach the point that you don't even see a police car going through your neighborhood for days? I don't know. But it's, it's something that I find unacceptable because I've been very consistent. Had long conversations with our county manager about this. I think as a local government agency, the county or the cities, our sister cities, are fundamental core values, our reason for being in local government, public safety is at the top of the list. There's absolutely nothing more important in every survey that's been taken, in my interaction with my <coughs> constituency, they want to feel safe. They want to feel safe in their homes, their businesses, their schools, their parks, their cars, everywhere. And if we don't, we as a government, don't put the same priority on making sure Metro as our police force ha does, has the resources to do their job effectively, not at bare minimum going the wrong way. If we don't provide you with the resources, shame on us. And that goes to the city also. But fundamentally, that's the problem. We, we, whatever we do today, it's going to be short term. It's going to be a Band-Aid. It's not going to do the things that you need to bring stability long term for your agency and that's officers on the street. And regardless of what debate has taken place the last 90 days, statistically, the more officers you have on the street, it impacts the crime rate. It pushes it back down. And just emotionally, when a citizen sees, and, and we had some testimonials a few years ago that, boy, the Metro's presence, uh, I know in, in Commissioner Weekly's ward, there was a lot of celebration about the visibility of officers in the neighborhoods. 
up in our area, Sun City, Summerlin, when they see Metro, you know, they might not even be responding to a crime. But the visibility of the Northwest Substation and Training Academy and Metro Police Park, take a look at the crime rates in and around that area. The visibility, the presence of Metro is a positive factor. So I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'm supporting anything that will get more resources to Metro. Uh, and, and certainly from a practical standpoint, understanding the impact it has on the city and the county. But I think uh, we, we do a disservice to the community if we keep criticizing, and not we as a board, but maybe as a community, keep criticizing the rare events at Metro and not focus on the needed resources. And I, I certainly will support either of the motions that are before us or either of the ordinances that are before us. Thank you. Thank you. Is this better? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've got specific questions as it relates to salaries and benefits. I've had our, you know, what actually we pay for salaries and benefits. I asked my, our, you know, the county staff to do this. I'm showing that every year for the past, from fiscal year 9 to 13, there has been a difference between what we've budgeted for salaries and benefits at Metro and what we've actually spent. That's average. We've budgeted. In, on average, in excess of $18 million more than we've actually spent at Metro. And every year, we have allocated more than was actually spent the year before on salaries. So if we're allocating the money to fill those positions, they weren't getting filled in these previous years. Because uh, we were holding them vacant because we knew we were going to need the savings to pay towards the deficit even though our budget was being reduced as I said before you know and there's uh, another and this isn't you know your the other part of that too commissioner is is come July 1st if we're authorized an increase of 50 to 50 officers they're not all hired on July the 1st you know you put them through an academy depending on your attrition uh, some of those bodies might not get hired for six, eight years, or say it's a civilian position, and we now have the money for it, and it's a technical position at our lab, requires us to do a search for that particular individual or individuals, and then by the time they come and arrive, then you have that salary savings, um, and you carry that over. I don't think that much, that's any different than any other governmental entity does when it comes to uh, the budgeting part. And we've talked about this at length at uh, fiscal affairs and stuff because we've been that fund balance that we've had uh, on the general fund side. Um, that's why I believe in 2011 when I came before you, you took more out of the fund balance than I wanted you to. I wanted to be able to carry more of that forward. But you, you all felt that it was more important to take that money and use it somewhere else within county government. Um, so that's what took place. And I appreciate you felt that way, but we have to balance everything, whether it's Metro or the courts or family services. or So it's difficult. It's not, 
I'm not saying it's not I, difficult. I don't, I, I'm not arguing with you. Uh, I you were. The recent arbitration that we just went through, and I can uh, agree, I think that it was a small award compared to what other labor groups have gotten. I will agree with you on that one. I am very concerned about, I didn't get to see the last and final offers, offers on either side of that situation. In my understanding, Council, if you can tell me, those are public? You know, I don't know what we offered versus what the PPA offered on that. But the arbitration letter that I have that was written by Mr. Perkovich does not comply with Nevada Revised Statutes. It simply doesn't. I've read a dozen or half a dozen arbitration awards that, that we've been involved with. I've never had one that's a page and a paragraph long. It doesn't explain why the, he made the decision that he did, and it doesn't give a financial fiscal impact to that, which is required under 288.215. Now, is there a reason? Well, I don't know, number one, Commissioner, I don't know why the gentleman wouldn't write it to the letter of the law. I mean, that's what he does for a living. He's an arbitrator. Um, I can't say that. Um, I believe uh, people have asked me. I told them to have that information forwarded to you as well as the other fiscal affairs members on what the last best was from a department standpoint. Um, I, I've got a memo coming to you today uh, telling you exactly what the fiscal impact would be. In fact, I told you on the phone yesterday what the fiscal impact will be to the Metropolitan Police Department as well as the Clark County Detention Center based on that arbitration award. And, and I know you did, and you are going to. I, I wasn't. In, I'm not in the arbitration. You, you understand that. I'm. I'm not in the arbitration uh, process. And, and I appreciate that, Sheriff. And you have been forthcoming and said that you would forward me the last and final offer. But three people have told me that now, and I still don't have it. So I would like to see. Well, what I, I'll get it for you, Commissioner. Uh, I think you can appreciate that uh, between yesterday uh, and today, uh, my day's been filled a little bit with. Uh, running a very large police organization and preparing for today. So I understand that. Give me a little, if, I'll, I'll get you the, I don't want to give you the number and then it turns out that my memory is not correct. Okay, if you could get me both final offers. I will call you this afternoon. You got some free time? I, I don't know how long we'll be here, but as soon as I'm done here, I have free time. Uh, I think you I, have my cell number. I guess everybody would like, I don't, Commissioner, I, if you could send that to all of us, that would be free, and the all fiscal the affairs as well. Yes. I get Fiscal, that as long as it's public, Mary, that's right, Ms. Miller. Uh, so, and then we'd have to talk to the arbitrator why he didn't write a letter that is in compliance, because I don't understand that. In reading what was passed at the legislature, Ms. Miller, I'm a little confused. I thought, or I was under the impression, that the .15 that was authorized, the representation was made that it was going to be used solely for more cops. Is that not true? That's my understanding that the purpose of the legislature is. Well, then how could we use it to fill the hole to begin with? Uh, well, I can tell you that when they reduced it to 0 0.15, um, my, I believe my, that would have been, where's Chuck? Yeah, was it assembly or Senate? Uh, assembly. No, you got to come my down. My assembly this testimony color. was um, that that would only afford us the ability to use towards our deficit. But and I can tell you in caucus meetings as well as if this was one of the big uh, topics of conversation, Commissioner, as it is here, um, you know, today. The fact that because it was being reduced from a 0.25 down to a 0.15, we were not going to have uh, that additional revenue that the 0.25 would give us to, to hire the additional bodies. But does, I guess my concern is, does the legislation allow it to be used to fill a budget deficit? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chuck Calloway for the record. I'm Director of Intergovernmental Services for Metro. First of all, uh, during the testimony at the legislative session, uh, we made it clear that the revenue from the quarter cent or the 0.15 uh, would be used for police officer positions. Um, now, the sheriff in his testimony did state that depending on how much revenue we got, uh, we could hire an additional 100 positions by 2016 but that initially there was this $30 million deficit that would have to be offset and that we would use some of that revenue to offset the deficit and it would be for police officer positions as the voters intended in the original ballot initiative. I believe it was in April 
uh, when the assembly amended the bill to the 0.15 and um, and then again in testimony it was said that decreasing it from the 0.25 to the 0.15 uh, would impact our ability to add extra officers into the future because uh, the revenue would be would be basically a cut that we would be receiving okay but I was under the impression that they lifted supplanting language for the first 0.25 for the reserve whatever you want to call it that for that pot of money that was built up the first 0.25, but this increase had to go for more officers. It couldn't be used for anything else. Am I mistaken in understanding that? Um, Mr. Chairman, my, my understanding is that the supplanting language was lifted until 2016 um, on any revenue from the uh, more cops sales and use tax. Okay. I'm I didn't understand that from the way of what legislators that had spoken to me, that they only supported that based on the idea that it was going to be additional police officers, uh -huh. not filling a budget hole. The conversations, Mr. Chairman, that I had with the legislature at the time was they understood that we had uh, this $30 million deficit, and they kept asking us, how many additional officers will you be able to put on the street? How many additional officers? Uh, with the... 0.15, we, uh, I testified um, on the final day of the session during the special session uh, on the floor of the assembly that uh, our intent was by 2016, if the revenue was there, we could put an additional 100 bodies uh, on the street above and beyond filling the revenue that would be needed to fill our budget shortfall. But, and I don't know where if you had a chance to look at it. Is but the revenue would be used for police officer positions whether it was to pay for those 250 existing positions that we wouldn't have the revenue to pay for next year, or whether in moving into the future it was adding additional officers. It would be used strictly for police officers. We wouldn't take that revenue and, and build a building or buy a helicopter or something. It would be used for police officer okay. positions. Ms. Miller? The language of enabling legislation does say it's supposed to employ, equip additional police officers and put some requirements on there that uh, an equal number of unfilled budgeted positions using money other than the proceeds of the tax must be filled, or they have to go to the local government committee to get a waiver. So the intent of it clearly was for additional police officers. So you can't, that, see that's what I had understood, that it would have to be used for more police officers. It can't be used to fill this budget hole. I, I, I disagree, Commissioner, and there was another. I got a lawyer here telling me that. Well, I've got lawyers that'll say, I, I guarantee okay. he'll say that. Bring one up. Opposite. If you got okay. yours here, I'm happy to listen so to your explanation. Well, we, we've been through this on, on a number of occasions. I, I don't know. I mean, we, we were clear with the legislature. What the legislature didn't want us to do is to use it for things other than police officer positions. If we were going to use it to backfill our budget shortfall, that we wouldn't use it for other things other than those police officers. And, you know, we, when we're dealing with legislative, we start talking about this legislative intent and a number of other things. They, they put in a number of checks and balances from this waiver process that you have to go through um, in order for us to uh, meet uh, the obligation that comes down. And, you know, I, I got to tell you as well is, uh, when the final draft for this uh, um, state well, the law came out, it was on, on a Sunday afternoon right at the end of the session. And when you got it, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, there were four different color codes um, in regards to language changes. So I hear your concern. Um, I say not hold up the process today uh, because of that, uh, but let us take a look at it and further evaluate it. Uh, but I think you're going to find, as, as I have found up to this sure. point in time, that we can use the funds. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Brown. semantics and legal. Let's, I just need to understand, when, when we're talking about filling the budget deficit, you're talking about hiring police officers with the supplanting language to fill that deficit. Is that, is that correct? Or I get the impression that you're going to use the $30 million shortfall, the money to pay for additional gas for the helicopter, or I just need to understand, are you in agreement that if they use the supplanting language to hire more cops to fill the $30 million budget, that that is, would be illegal? Yeah. 
my understanding was that they would hit we you were left with the responsibility of using either the first quarter cent or getting the funding entities to fill your hole and then the new money had to be used to hire additional totally brand new police officers. Mr. Calloway, you're telling me that's not true. That's uh, not your interpretation. Mr. Chairman, Chuck Calloway again for the record. Maybe where the confusion is is that in SB1, um, we were required to fill any uh, current budgeted authorized positions that were not filled before we could access the revenue from the more cops fund. So if, if you folks had budgeted us a uh, certain X amount of num uh, number of officers and we had 30 vacancies, we would have to fill those 30 vacancies before we could access the more cops revenue. But the discussions that I had with the legislature, uh, that was also part of the, re the reporting requirement. Um, we have to go before the interim finance committee <laughs> and report uh, as to one of those five levels of uh, transparency that the sheriff talked about, we have to go before the interim finance committee and report on how the funds are used to ensure that they are used for police officer positions. But okay. we made it very clear with the, with the uh, assembly and the Senate that 100 additional police officers with the .15 would be what we would strive for going into 2016, understanding that we would also save 250 police officer positions. Okay, but the way you described at the beginning isn't how you described it at the end. You know, the legislation said that you were responsible to fill any vacancies, which would be a result of the $30 million shortfall before you could use this money, which would mean this would have to be used for additional officers over and above the $30 million. I believe what the legislation says, if you don't meet that, then you apply for the waiver. Correct. Okay, and then you can on approval of that okay. waiver. Okay, could I, could I appreciate it, Mr. Calloway? Could I ask Mr. Collins to give me his side of this? Because this was explained to me a different way. Chris Collins, not Tom Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Collins, for the record. Um, I would say to you, Mr. Chairman, that we, too, had a full-time lobbyist up there who worked for me who was uh, intimately involved in the More Cops bill. It is our understanding of that law that this new tax cannot be used for anything outside of hiring police officers. The 130 or $40 million, whatever it is, reserve that is from the first quarter cent the supplanting language was lifted for a period of three years, and that money was uh, available for any purpose. But we never supported the movement of officers from the general fund to the more cops fund. We do not support that today. And quite frankly, we do not support the raising of the tax unless it will hire new policemen. We believe that was the intent of the law, and we believe that's what the taxpayers voted for. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I appreciate it. I'm arrested. Who was, who had a question? I know. I went back. Commissioner Collins or Commissioner G, did you have your hand up? Commissioner Collins. Okay, Commissioner Collins, and you can make a comment and then a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just a uh, couple of things that got said up here. That not only did we vote unanimous or five to two, but North Las Vegas voted unanimously. Mesquite voted unanimously, their city councils, Boulder City unanimously, um, Henderson, and Las Vegas voted all but one city councilman for the 25 cent resolution as well. I just, when, uh, whatever happened to the people five or six or eight years ago. But, uh, you know, I want to say that as, as well. And uh, I was willing, Mr. Chairman, if you're ready for a motion, to make a motion on, on 917.13-3. And your motion, Commissioner Collins? Can you spell it out for everyone that? What are you advocating? That you're making a motion. I'm for the I'm for more cops, but I just um, the nine one seven one three dash three seven F. You want to let Susan make that motion? That's fine with me. No, no. You. I said you could make the motion first. So, whatever motion you'd like to. <laughs> okay, somebody. I was going to move a motion first for the seven five to see if it had passed. That's what was my. That's my intent. 
Okay, do we have any discussion on the motion? That's seeing and hearing none. First, Pleading, seeing and hearing no discussion, please cast your vote on the motion Commissioner Collins made to raise it 0 0.075. Motion passes. Who oh, needs five? Motion does not pass. I apologize. Motion does not pass. Commissioner Collins has another motion. I'll make a motion on. 9-17-13-4. We have a motion on the floor to increase the tax by 0.15. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none, please cast your votes. Motion fails. Uh, I move that we table this item and bring it back no sooner for another vote than uh, six months. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none, please cast your votes. Mr. Chairman, could you repeat the motion? My, my, motion, my motion is that we've had public down here in three times now that we do not bring this item back for a vote for six months from today's day. Please cast your votes. Motion to table fails. That one doesn't require super majority. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. What? Is there another motion? Next item. <laughs> 